I actually met with caterers and tasted some of the food that's going to be served at prom. And prom will be held the 30th of April at Crisetti Hall. And the finalizing for our budget and ticket prices will be announced next week if everything goes perfectly. We also celebrated National Counselor Appreciation Week by gifting each of our counselors Starbucks cups with their names on each of them. Here's, those are some of our beloved counselors and my counselor, Ms. Myers, who has always been super supportive, especially in all of my college applications. So we just wanted to celebrate them. And students have also continued with their endless creativity, attempting to represent the diversity of thought and diversity of backgrounds that we have on campus. One example of this is the Watsonville High School Student Union that has begun. It started amongst a, a class of 2023, and they're a sort of advocacy group trying to represent the voices of Watsonville High School and trying to aid our community that way. And a group of students has also dedicated themselves to trying to make a, an entire feature film completely led by students, completely run by students. And casting calls for that are beginning, I believe, this month, and auditions will be beginning next month. Um, and this is all despite uh, something, well, a tragedy that happened uh, with one of our students this past week. And a lot of difficulties <laughs> have been found, especially through our class of 2023. Last Wednesday, news broke out to Watsonville High School about the passing of one of our juniors, uh, Isaac Ruelas. Isaac was 16 years old at the time of his passing and was a beloved classmate, especially amongst class of 2023. In response to his passing, we have continued to try to ensure that our students are receiving the help that they need. And that's one of the main reasons why I share this. So for any Watsonville High School students in the room today or watching this or watching this playback, I would like to give everyone the reminder that grief counseling is available at our school and Miss Medina, our social emotional counselor, her door is always open for there. I would also like to remind all these students that we are keeping the wellness center open as often as possible for anything that they would need or that they could need. And for students and members of the Watsonville High School community and the PVUSD community that wish to show their support for Isaac's family, there's a GoFundMe that's available right now. For those who are able to donate and wish to aid in the payment of Isaac's funeral expenses, you can find the GoFundMe online. I hope that everyone here, if they are in need of any counseling or any emotional support of that form, know that they have access to that and that if they wish to show their support, they're able to do so in this time of healing. So thank you all for listening. Thank you, Armand. Mm -hmm. well, yes, that's okay. Okay. Is there anyone here from <coughs> Oh, Itsy, your new school. Yeah, come on up. All right, once again, good evening, esteemed board members, superintendent, Dr. Rodriguez, and audience. As you all know, my name is Itzy Sanchez, and I am a senior at New School. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Anthony Godinez, and I am also a senior at New School, and thank you for having us here tonight. Our theme for this school year is Restore, because we were gone from in-person learning for almost a year and a half. All right. Um, Second, this year, new school committee. Hold on, give me one second. Oh yeah, this year, new school committee day celebrated its 28th anniversary, as I shared with you guys a few minutes ago. We did not hold a celebration, but we wanted to share this milestone with you. These are a couple facts about our school. Our school first site was at 521 Main Street, which is now La Manzana Learning Community Day School. Before we were the Aztecs, we were known as the Black Sheep. Olga Cornejo, our administrative assistant, had, has, had seen at New School Community Day for 19 years. <laughs> so Enrichment Fridays are continuing this quarter with a new emphasis. Um, at the beginning of the semester, we had a reset to our Enrichment Friday. First, we start the day off um, with Santa Cruz Art Council, which includes guitar lessons with Juan, five elements of hip hop with Luis, art reflections with um, Abram, and fine art with Monica. Then some students participate in team sports. 
um, in the Monterey Bay Alternative School Athletic League, and this quarter it's basketball. And the other students head downtown to Digital Nest, where they're currently making a business plan and environmental science workshop, where they um, work on hand, hands on projects and Watson Brillante. Here are some pictures of Digital Nest and the science workshop and the basketball team. All right, uh, this is our third year of student-led conference and the second of the school year participation was much better this time around. Um, they occur it occurred on fe February 15th and the 17th. Most students did it in person and a few did it virtually. New School Committee Day offered food on both days. On Tuesday, they offered us pizza and Thursday's burritos. Our advisory teachers were there to help and support with the process. 26 students completed their conferences with a parent. Our conferences include attendance data, our goals, credit recovery data, a, our graduation plan, and what digital citizenship means. This year we're using Five Star Student to help motivate students in a positive way. Um, our first one was on December 15th and our second one was today. The goal is to do one every month, and students have an opportunity to redeem their five-star students' points, uh, which will be re rewarded with snacks, beverages, soups, new school gear, gift cards, and special privileges. Students earn points by attendance and demonstrating the aspect avenues of achievements, which are taking action, having zeal, taking responsibility, earning it, caring, and setting goals, and also using appropriate language. Well, yeah. And uh, there's some pictures from our last redeem day and today's redeem day. All right, thank you all for your time and attention. Once again, I'm Itzi Sanchez and I'm a senior at New School. And my name is Anthony Godinez and I'm also a senior at uh, New School Community Day. Thank you. Thank you, that was uh, both great presentations. Uh, President, um, is, uh -huh. it, is it okay if I can make a comment? Sure. Uh, I would just like to thank the founder of New School, Mr. Don Engelston. He was my principal when I was at uh, Mini White, and it was, it was his vision to create the school, and I would just like to announce Don Engelston. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next we have, I think, a video by Diamond Tech. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. My name is Ariana Jimenez Espinosa, and I am excited to catch you up on everything we have been doing since second semester started. Our character education theme for third quarter is imagination, and we have had a lot of opportunities since January to be imaginative through projects and activities. First of all, we would like to thank everyone who donated and supported our Adopt-A-Family project in December. Our amazing officer manager, Jasmine Samora, helped deliver the donations and we were able to help a family in need who lives in the Diamond Tech neighborhood. It was a joy to see our community coming together and supporting each other. As always, we started with our day one, two, and three seminars, team building and pancake breakfast. This year, we set up a makerspace for Beast Battle. Our community friends from next door participated. The next door neighborhood donated lots of cardboard and materials and even a life-size chicken for scale purposes for the hen house projects. We have been working on several projects this quarter and we have finally submitted our Beast Battle 2021 to judges and are awaiting feedback. Our seniors have been working in collaboration with the real videography company in Santa Cruz called Inspira to develop a new promo video for the Diamond Tech. Here's our latest work. Welcome to Diamond Technology Institute, a shining gem in Pajo Valley Unified School District. Diamond Tech is a fully accredited high school and unlike traditional high schools, our school focuses on learning through design thinking and project-based learning. Diamond Technology Institute prepares us for our futures, whether it is a career out of high school, a two-year college, or a four-year university. There are only 25 students per grade level for a total of 100 students. 
Throughout the program study, we are encouraged to practice innovation and problem solving. We work collaboratively, and because we are a small school, our teachers have the opportunity to work with us and give us individual support so we can be successful. Diamond Tech focuses on college and career preparation to help us build skills for success. All students graduate with a 10-year plan and a personal website, which helps us to know exactly what our next steps will be after graduation. Diamond Tech helps us move forward in our learning and advance through the programs offered at the school or through concurrent college enrollment. Our school exposes us to real world experiences and our teachers want to put the latest technology to student hands. So we become the experts and leaders of tomorrow. Our school values and works closely with us to provide a safe space to grow where everyone can feel welcome. Our community offers many options for our diverse interests like student leadership, sports, clubs, mentorships, school activities, fundraisers, guest speakers, field trips, and much, much more. Learning is an adventure, and we would like to share our adventure with you. So if you want a challenge and to be part of an innovative high school with a specialty educational program, then it is time to join the 100 with the strength of 1000. Nice. Oh, Our class going, competed in Foundation for Innovations, Social Media and Marketing Challenge. Seniors Shiva Grahik and Evan Strader took first place in the development of marketing materials and a 12-month social media plan for the Steinbeck Center. All of the materials you see here were developed by these two students. Lastly, it was great to celebrate Valentine's Day and get back to having fun, some fun. We made old-fashioned Valentine card boxes and exchanged val Valentines, had our selfie photo booth, and brought desserts to share. It felt good to get back to normal after the rough Omicron start. Don't forget to follow us on social media, and thank you again for the opportunity to share what we have been doing at Diamond Tech. Thank you, Diamond Tech. That was super, that was super fun to see you that video. So before we approve um, our agenda, I'd like to um, point out that we got several very lovely donations um, in support of our Emerald Lagasse Culinary Garden and Teaching Kitchen. Um, we got nine donations in total, $124,800. So um, with many, many thanks to Julie Packard for um, a donation of $50,000. Um, a donation from Miles and Roseanne um, Ryder Foundation uh, for $50,000. A donation from Jim Edens, $15,000. A donation from Joe Griffin, $5,000. A donation from Gail and Joe Ortiz, $3,000. A donation from Terry Ballantyne, a donation of $500. To Dan Weiser, a donation of $50. Thank you, Dan. Donation from Allie and Nick Sutton of $1,000. And a donation from Margaret Gordon of $250. So we thank, um, we thank all the donors, many of them, for their interest and um, confidence in our um, culinary garden and teaching kitchen, and I think we're almost to the finish line in terms of our fundraising. How much more do we need, do you think? 310,000. So we need 310,000 more dollars to finish the project. So thank you to everybody who's donated to date. And with that, I'm looking for a motion to approve tonight's agenda. I move to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously, thank you. Um, I need, um, uh, we're looking to approve the minutes from our last board meeting on February 9th. I'll I move, move to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. That motion I abstain. passes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Jen Shocker abstains. Motion passes 6 1, no, is it 610? 6 6 one, six zero one. Six zero one. Thank you. Next up on our agenda is um, 6.1, um, visitor not agenda items. This is a time for public comment. Do we have any speakers? 
We do. We okay. have eight speakers for eight. this item. So I'm going to be calling three people at a time. We have a Marilyn Garrett, followed by Bill Beecher, followed by Matt Montgomery. Let's see if this works now. Marilyn Garrett, I taught in this district for about 20 years. The tremors you see I have, my health provider thinks are from working next to fields of pesticide at a messy school. And I also read that the radio frequency microwave radiation from wireless technology has the same effects on the neurological system. And young people are especially at risk. As I watched the presentation here on technology, I shudder because microwave radiation and Wi-Fi and wireless technology is very damaging. A recent article I just saw is in the publication Wise Traditions. This is WestonAPrice.org, and it's their winter 21, 2021 edition. Radio frequency radiation a significant factor in increasing thyroid cancer. And if people are holding a cell phone here, increased brain tumors, salivary gland tumors, thyroid cancer, around here colorectal cancers related to the radiation. I met a 17-year-old young man who said, oh, I know about it being dangerous. I said, how do you know? Because hardly anyone's read about the adverse effects. Told me he kept his cell phone in his left pocket. This is a true sad story. Developed testicular cancer from the radiation and had to have his left testicle removed at age 17. This is no coincidence, nor is it a presentation I saw on health impacts of wireless radiation. A woman, young woman with breast cancer, four points of the cancer exactly where the four antennas of the bone were resting against her skin and her bra. Thank you. We need to have this harm removed from our school district. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Good evening. I'd like to do a presentation on the top Hispanic districts in the state and kind of compare them to what we do here. Um, here's my sources of data. Here's the six schools that I looked at. These are the same six schools I looked at 14 years ago. They're doing even better than they did then. And you can see what kind of percentage of Hispanics, similar to ours. So if we looked at English language arts, uh, three of them are doing outstanding, as well as Aptos Whites. This is a graph showing the state and where Aptos uh, is much lower English language learners which for us is usually a killer they rarely score well like two to five percent this is how well they do in meeting or exceeding the standard on socioeconomically disadvantaged uh, similar results that uh, people aren't penalized because they're poor uh, students with disabilities which for the state in our district is a travesty everybody does very poorly but not in these districts so common factors from interviewing the superintendents and principals at these schools they do heavy intervention they identify at-risk students in the first three weeks and then they get them help before during and after school and in summer sessions and in talking to one of the superintendents last week he says I treat all the kids the same doesn't matter what ethnicity or whether they have economic issues, treats them all the same, get some intervention. They also do early transition to English. At one school, they have no English language learners because they transition them, and they're the top performer, Columbine. Last English immersion only on campus. And I 
left you something to read. Thank you. Uh, you also have two requests for agenda items in front of you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. All right. May I begin? Open up. All right. At home. Good evening, board members. How many times do we need to see masks fail before we accept observable reality? Santa Cruz's County's Dr. Gail Newell re reinstated the county's mask mandate on November 22nd. Cases were low at the time. We're going to be taking a recess oh, okay. now. Enjoy. Uh, anyways, this wasn't in the midst of an ongoing surge. Let's check in on it. That doesn't look good. Cases went up about 600%. Look at that change in growth rate. Okay, take two. December 15th. They can still listen. I don't know. They'll play it. California reinstated the statewide mask mandate. When announcing the new mandate, incompetent Dr. Mark Gailey makes it clear that this is being done proactively because we have a tool that we know has worked and can work. It worked so well that cases went up 700% and they extended the mask mandate naturally. Let's look at district data. At the board's meeting in October, we heard a school nurse, Elizabeth Thorne, give us another claim in support of child masking. I quote, our rates are down in our schools because of mask wearing. Rates are down compared to what? Let's compare how low the district's numbers are to the general population of the United States. The district dashboard says there has been 3,400 student and 372 staff COVID cases since August 12th. In the same time period across the US, there were 42 million cases since August 12th. So what does that mean? In the same time period, 17.7% of students in the district were infected, 15.7% of district staff, and 12.7% of the US as a whole. So much for the rates being down thanks to masks. Considering this data, I ask you, is this what success looks like? How would you define failure then? Please end this mandate and return choice to parents and students. All right. Cool recess.
Okay, calling the meeting back to order. I think we're still on item 6.1, public comment. Do we have further speakers? We do. This is Monica Nolan, followed by Chris Webb and Mariah Segura and Riley Gomez. Does this just automatically work? It's on, okay. Sorry, I haven't done this. So give me one second, okay? Point yeah. of order. So. so the gentleman needs another chance to be able to speak. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Do you want me to wait? Okay. Yes, okay. please. Um, Matt Montgomery. Thank you, board members. I'll start my time. Good evening. I'd like to show the data again, so this is Santa Cruz County, so our mask mandate went into place November 22nd, while well, rates were still low. This was done by Gail Newell. After that, cases went up 600%. That's not a successful policy. I would describe that as failure. People compare masks to seatbelts sometimes. Could you imagine if we put in a seatbelt mandate and traffic fatality deaths look like that? I think we might question that policy. Statewide, we saw something similar. The mask mandate went into place months before the surge happened. Afterwards, cases went up 500%. Nonetheless, the mask mandate was extended. Again, is this what success looks like? Is this a workable policy? Where is the actual effect? We also heard, back in October, we heard someone from the district, a school nurse, say that our rates were low because of masking. Well, this was a nurse saying this, so I took her at her word. It's a respectable member of the community. So I looked up the actual rates. You can go to the Pajaro Valley, Pajaro Valley COVID dashboard. It'll tell you right now there were 3,412 COVID cases in our students from 12 August through February 22nd. For the staff, there were 372 cases. For the United States as a whole during that same time period, 42 million cases. So what does that work out to? Well, for Pajaro Valley students, that's an infection rate of 17.7%. For the staff, it's an infection rate of 15.7%. For the United States as a whole, so just America in general, 12.65% of the population became infected during that time. So if this is what success looks like, how would you define failure? How would you ever challenge this policy based off results if this is considered success? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and then resuming our next speakers. It is really. It is pretty annoying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we have Monica followed by Chris Webb and then Mariah Segura and Riley Gomez. All right, thank you board members and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, my name is Monica Allen. I am the academic counselor at Renaissance High School and New School with Ms. Itzy Sanchez over there. Um, ahora en español, hola, mi nombre es Monica Allen. Soy la consejera académica Renaissance High School y New School Community Day. Lo siento, mi gente, uh, mi español no muy bueno, um, but lo entiendo. Gracias. Um, coming into this position as an academic counselor for both of these schools, I actually never knew that I would love it so much. And some of you know me from my previous position at Aptos High. I loved that job a lot. 
So I love this even more than that. Um, if you can imagine, because you know how passionate I am. Um, I wanted to thank the board actually for approving this position, Dr. Rodriguez and Assistant Superintendent Kristen Schaus, because they believe that I am the right person for the job. And I'm not crying, I'm just nervous. <laughs> so um, I, just because I am so passionate. And so I did want to come here to talk about some of the good that's going on in our schools. As some of our student reps said, we are implementing P PBIS at New School a lot. And then Renaissance, we're kind of taking our, st our time to really hone in on that. And I think it's good to hear the good that's going on. And our students are really happy to be back with us. They don't like distance learning. They hope to never go back to it. And so that makes me happy because then that reminds me like they need us. They want to be with us. We have time to give to them. And um, I hope we can do that. So with that said, I do want to also talk about how we, I think some of my colleagues before have come to speak with you all about reinstating the after school program at Renaissance High. I know it doesn't happen in a day, but I'm coming in with fresh eyes and the students really need something more and they need somewhere safe to go. Um, we have a shorter day, and so transportation is a big issue for our students. And if we could see that happen and we can get that extra support for them, I really think that we could see a lot of change in our community um, at Renaissance High and then Watsonville, Pajaro in general. So thank you. Thanks for your comments. Is there no way to curtail the beeping? No. Dan Weiser. <laughs> I know, we have to be careful what you ask for, right? We asked for that clock, but now it's annoying us. Chris. <laughs> um, I want to express my profound thanks to the students who advocated for themselves and their teachers by speaking to this body about teacher wages. You make me hopeful for the future of my country and the results of your actions has made me hopeful PVUSD will, will retain more of its teachers than it otherwise would. I also want to thank PVFT members who acted to push for a long overdue salary schedule increase. While I know the T8 increase may not keep up with inflation or bring salaries to levels, to levels that make PVSD truly attractive to new hires, I feel worthwhile progress was made and I hope PVFT members uh, supported the agreement. I want to thank dis the district negotiations team for their respectful, good faith negotiations. When we work together, we can achieve great things for the PVSD community. I also want to thank you guys for the timer. I think it is good addition in spite of the beeps. Um, I also want to echo uh, Ms. Nolan's comment about uh, the after school program. I, you guys have heard me talk about the field before. There's there's talk from among the students about the alternative sports league and soccer, and I find it unfortunate that um, while we might be able to compete, we can't really practice unless it's on a blacktop, which uh, is a little disappointing. And I also, um, thinking of the negotiations and, and everything, I, th I think one of the reasons that it went as well as it did was because of the, the transparency of the district in terms of budgets. And that's something where I feel like we can take that same uh, model and, and bring it to sites. I know at all the PVFT meetings, they always have a budget report. And I feel this leads to um, greater trust in the leadership from the members. So I'd like to see that kind of transparency about school site budgets at school site council and possibly leadership or staff meetings. Um, I think it would really do good and it would avoid any appearances of in fiscal impropriety. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Hi. Hello. Hello, everyone. My name is Mariah Segura, and I'm here with my teammate, Riley Gomez and Julia. We're both currently seniors on the Watsonville High girls varsity softball team, along with the junior, I mean sophomore. And today we're here to address the poor conditions of our softball field. Every softball season, the girls and I witness the poor conditions of our field. To begin, our infield and outfield are not leveled, making our job as individuals playing softball even harder. Our outfield has dozens of holes, causing our teammates to run with their heads down in hopes of not falling or twisting their ankles. The fields have weeds growing uncontrollably everywhere. 
especially in the pitcher's bullpen, making it difficult to warm up pitchers during a live softball game. It is also very difficult when our women's bathroom only consists of one functioning stall, while the second one doesn't have a door and neither are wheelchair accessible. We have been told by Watsonville High School that we're not able to maintain our own field, but who will? Who will do it if no one is going to? Though we are thankful for the staff who have maintained our fields before and continue to cut the grass, we will not accept the bare minimum of our field getting cleaned one or two hours before our game, just as what happened last season. In 2021, we won the CCS Division I title for Watson High, and not everyone who visited and played our, on our field was satisfied with its condition. We saw coaches from the opposing team walking around our outfield looking for holes so that they could warn their out athletes before the game. My mother, who came to watch our game, couldn't push my father in his wheelchair because the grass was too thick and high, making it a safety issue. The field's conditions don't only affect players, but our families and friends. We are asking here today for a change. We would like to see weekly maintenance of our field, and if not, we ask that we're given the right to clean our fields and also parent volunteers because we cannot continue playing in these conditions. We would also love to see wheelchair accessible restrooms and a pathway created from the entrance to the stands so that the public and those in wheelchairs can have a safe and secure pathway. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that important um, item in front of us, you guys. I, I appreciate you coming tonight. Okay, next up we have um, Laura Asaro, followed by Donna Lef Lefever. Hello, board members. Nice to see you in person. I'm always so nervous. I'm, I'm a really outgoing, bubbly person, but I'm always so nervous when I get here. Um, first of all, I, I do want to give a very he deep, heartfelt thank you to our negotiation teams. I've been, I'm um, an elementary school teacher, Laura Azaro. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't in, um, introduce myself. And um, I've been teaching in the district for about 26 years. Came in on a really cool internship that the district offered. I was a special ed teacher for five years and now at the elementary level and um, I've really seen the morale drop so much the last 10 years and and then COVID hit and it, it was it just threw everything off so I'm just elated because it was a it's a decent it's a decent increase thank you for acknowledging that um, you know, but we have to go forward, and I, I do, you know, I, I emailed some of you, and, and I, I do understand it's, it's hard when we're publicly funded, um, and I do know that there's, there's funds that we can't touch, but I do want to assure you that I'm very involved. I, I go to the California Federation of Teachers Convention when we had it, and I do advocate for funding for our schools. Uh, we meet with the aides and the assistants there, and I've been to lobby days advocating very strongly for funding for our public schools. I just can't control what happens to it when it gets here. But I do appreciate the strong leadership we've had this last two years. Um, we're still in a pandemic, you know, we're, on paper we're staffed fully, but we're still understaffed all the time because of illness. Uh, that's, um, and family emergencies and things like that. But I really, really appreciate that you've been following the CDC guidelines. I haven't had a cold since school started because of the mask. The children are out playing and running and having a great old time. I don't see them hiding behind play structures, crying their eyes out because they have to wear a mask. We all laugh and play. They get thank breaks. You. Anyway, thank you for honoring that. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Donna Lefever. I'm a math teacher at Watsonville High School. Um, so uh, I do want to say I appreciate um, that there was a salary increase. Um, it's not quite near enough of where we need to get to. Um, 
I, this is my first year in the district, but I've been hearing about it. My mom's been a teacher in this district since I was nine or 10. Um, and so a very long time. And um, so yeah, there, it's just, there's some, it's challenging to listen to that and then now be a part of it and watch the, the way that we decide to fund our educators. Um, so something to just think about when we're, we're going, coming back again next year. Um, the other thing I wanna bring up though um, is the class sizes. I was having, a, we had a, me a department meeting with our, um, not a department meeting, like a team meeting with my other math two colleagues. And we're talking about some of the concerns that we're seeing, um, just the support that's needed for the kids in our math classes right now, especially having missed an entire year of learning. But I mean, it's, it's been an issue even beyond that. And, um, and one of the big concerns is that um, there is no repeating of a class. Like if the kids um, don't understand the content one year um, and they, they don't get a passing grade, um, there's this ingenuity like online program that they do to, for credit recovery. It's not sufficient in teaching them because it's a computer program and they don't learn from it. So the reason that they weren't able to access all the support they have in the classroom from the teacher is because the teacher is spread so thin amongst so many students. And then the support that we're offering to these kids just so that they can have the credits in order to graduate is we'll put you in a classroom with other kids that are doing this online program and they're not getting any of that support for that content. So then they move on to the next class and they're not prepared again. So I think that we need to rethink that structure and really reduce those class sizes. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Those are all speakers for this item. Okay, uh, next are employee organizations, starting with um, PVFT 7.1. Good evening, President DeSerpa and Dr. Rodriguez and Board of Trustees. I am Radhika Kirkman. I am the Chief Negotiator for PVFT. Um, and I just want to give you guys uh, a little message. I know we just TA'd. So today our membership ratified the TA for our total compensation for 21-22 school year. Um, I want to just take a moment. We wanted to thank the board and the district for working with our team to come to that agreement on the ongoing salary increase and the status quo on our health benefits for this school year. We know that an ongoing salary increase is an important first step to ensuring that our students have the educators and the support staff that they need to be successful. We do understand that the cost of living in this area may not prevent some people from having to look elsewhere, but we were hopeful that it will also keep many more educators in this district. Um, coming to an agreement before the end of this school year allows the district to also update our salary schedules. And so we're hopeful that that will attract more educators into the district. We do still have many, many vacancies, over 30 vacancies. And we know that a long-term sub does provide some consistency. It does not compare to a permanent credentialed teacher of record. Someone who is knowledgeable about their subject area and who can build those home and school connections with their students. Um, our team is especially thankful that we were able to come to an agreement in such a relatively short period of time. My team are teachers who are actually working in classrooms, so they were very thankful of that. Um, we are hopeful now to continue working with the district and to look ahead to our contract negotiations that are coming up. So I appreciate all of the collaborative effort that went into this, and I know it's going to take a lot more to solve the ongoing uh, crises that are happening in education right now. So thank you. Thank you, Radhika. Is anyone here from CSEA? Point of order. Mm. Is there, are there any speakers to this item? I apologize, Bill Beecher. Mr. Beecher. I think uh, at the last board meeting, we all felt pretty bad for the teachers and the condition they're working in. And uh, I wanted to address that uh, I think we need to rethink what we're doing here. Uh, the statistics teacher, you might re 
for member said that we have 8% of the teachers retiring every year and we only have 3% new teachers coming in. That's a difference of 5%. That means every year we will lose 50 teachers, we'll have fewer and fewer teachers available for the classroom. In five years, we will lose 250 teachers. So we can't keep teaching the way we are now. So I'm here to ask PVFT to work with the district to rethink how we teach. Now, COVID-19, the Khan Academy and several other areas have taught us that we can teach differently and need fewer teachers. And by doing that, you can pay the teachers more. How would you do it? You use attrition. If we're going to lose 50 teachers every year, you could use that money to fund the teachers that remain. And so the flipped classroom, Khan Academy concept, and using online learning, we take our best teachers to create programs like they did this last year, and we have teaching via the internet. The students come into the classroom and in the collaborative room are able to get an assignment, perform it, and then present it in the classroom, that's a better form of learning than just straight sitting in a lecture hall listening to a teacher for an hour. So I would ask PVFT to work with the district to rethink how we teach. I also would challenge the board, you should be in there stimulating, recognizing we have a structural problem. You can't solve it but you can deal with it. Thank you. You have to put your card in ahead of the speaker, ahead of the agenda, ahead of the agenda item, you need to put a speaker card in if you'd like to speak, so I'm sorry. Okay, so we have next up is 7.2 CSEA. Is anyone here from CSEA tonight? 7.3 Pavam, Pajaro Valley Association of Managers. We have Do Mr. Dan Weiser is going to comment for us tonight. Yes. Let's see if we can raise that up a little bit. Yes, thank you, President Deserpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. My name is Dan Weiser. I'm the very proud Director of Technology for Pajaro Valley um, for our Technology Services Department. Um, and tonight I'm going to tell you about some of the incredible work that the technology services team has been doing and then just want to kind of acknowledge some of the, the unsung heroes that work in the background keeping everything afloat and, and functioning. Um, so as you know, technology is constantly changing. Um, it, the need for technology is constantly growing and then everything is constantly being updated and modified and improved, which leads to a need for very skilled staff, not only in terms of managing all that technology, but being able to quickly learn new technologies um, and support all that. And, and it's a never ending, ongoing process of being a lifelong learner. And I really think that um, the technology services staff kind of exemplifies that for our district. Um, they're constantly learning new skills, new systems, new ways to improve those systems. Um, and then they're constantly teaching and learning from each other. Uh, and one of the sort of jokes we talk about this building as being a teaching hospital. Um, and I think it's, it's very true in terms of the way that we, we, we support each other, we learn from each other, and we teach each other every day. Um, and each of the technology services staff members have very specific roles and areas of expertise. Um, and their ability to collaborate and learn from each other has been really instrumental. So um, starting with site techs who are out at the school sites, working with students, classrooms, supporting projects, um, and then all of the devices that they support, fixing, deploying, refreshing. It's um, an incredible undertaking at every school in the district. And then all the behind the scenes uh, en engineers, technicians, um, the uh, district techs and communication technicians trying to keep the network functioning. Today, for example, we had um, four schools that were affected with, by power outages and network outages, and they were running all over the district, bringing back up the networks and uh, supporting the, those school sites. So. It's, uh, it's, we're very fortunate to have an incredibly talented and, and ongoing, improving uh, team of collaborating technicians in the district. So I just wanted to acknowledge the work that they do every day. Um, 
and then talk about some of the, the great projects that we've all been collaborating on, uh, one of which is the E-Rate and Measure L Bond Fund network infrastructure that we applied for last year. That was a, a $1.5 million project across the whole district, and we're in the middle of implementing that right now. Um, and then with ECF, Emergency Connectivity Fund Funds, we're starting to receive all the devices that we applied for and funded through that, the, the Emergency Connectivity Fund, which is going to be a great um, support for our refresh process this year. It's, um, it's almost 9,000 devices that are going into the classrooms. Um, and then we also have, we've just basically completed all those um, InformaCast, right, the clock bell paging systems that we've been installing at all the school sites. The last two sites, Ohlone and Radcliffe, have just been completed. They, they've implemented the systems, trained the staff, troubleshot the whole process, and then helped to make sure that everything was tuned. So if some of the speakers were too loud, they brought them down or brought the quiet ones up. And so those projects are now complete. Um, and I just really wanted to acknowledge the incredible work of all of the technology services team every day, um, because without them, there's no way we could keep so much going um, all the time. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Were there any speakers to that item? No? Okay. 7.4 CWA, Communication Workers of America. Okay, we'll move on to um, item 8.1 under report and discussion. Uh, this is data trends, patterns, and representing the whole child, whole family, whole community. This is a report by Lisa Aguirre, our Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction. Just seeing if there's a laser pointer here. Okay. Uh, good evening, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, this evening I will be going over um, data trends and patterns um, in looking at our students for this um, first semester and, and sometimes over the past few years. Pajaro Valley Unified School District has eight key performance uh, district indicators that we use to monitor our students' academic health and social-emotional well-being. In addition to graduation rates, I will be going over the six highlighted KPIs that you see here. So the first uh, district key performance indicator, KPI, that I'll be going over this evening is our five-star data. Five-star is a student recognition program and students are recognized for actions and leadership aligned to their school values. Um, and so what this graph represents is the percentage of students throughout our district that have been recognized. These students that the percentage um, are unduplicated students. So if I was at Aptos High School and I received, um, I was recognized twice by the five star system, I would only count as once towards this. As you can see, since the beginning of the school year, monthly, the uh, percentage of our students that are recognized uh, through the five-star five point system has increased. Um, and so we are continuing to push it through. Each month, this data is updated on our um, district data dashboard, and we look at it to see to make sure that we are um, going in the upward trend. So the next thing is the, uh, the site wellness team um, information. And so last year during the, um, we were in distance learning during the pandemic, one of the things that we started were the site and the district wellness teams. The reason why we did this is that we wanted to have a way to identify students who were not engaging in online distance learning. We realized that the system worked well within our schools to identify students, so we kept it going for this year to figure out which students were not doing um, well in academically or social emotionally as we returned to the school site. Um, and so this is updated quarterly. Um, and so if we look on the school sites, it, what we can see from quarter one to quarter two, because we have not hit quarter three yet, is that social anxiety has actually decreased um, and that academic stress and attendance concerns have, are one of the two of the things that have um, increased through it. And so what happens is that school sites, each one has their own um, wellness team and then the referrals come in and they look at the students and they assign them to different department members based on what the concerns are and then different uh, staff members will follow up with students. Are, are those unduplicated as well? Those referrals? Those are the number of, um, so once a student is on the list, mm -hmm. they don't repeat. So those are unduplicated. Okay. 
So that's the number, not percentage. Um, next is Sown to Grow. Um, as you know, um, Sown to Grow is a program that where we can monitor our students' feelings. And so weekly, students are asked, um, how are they feeling? And if they want to, they can expand on the reason why they chose that they're feeling that way. Um, on a five-point scale, students uh, indicate whether they're very sad, sad, okay, happy, or very happy. One meaning that they're very sad, five being that they are very happy. What we do is we take the average of the five-point scale of all of our students and we plot them on the graph. And so we look at the trend of our students' emotional health, their feelings, over the school year. And this is updated weekly. Uh, the lowest point on this scale is actually um, January 18th, with the, which is the second week that we came back from um, the December break. And as you remember, this was the start of the Omicron variant where we didn't know which was, it was rapidly transmissible. So we didn't know how long we were gonna be out and how many people were gonna be out. And so it was a very unknown time. And that was represented in our students' um, data. Staying with Sone to Grow, um, these two graphs, the one on the left compares our students' feelings and how they're, how they're doing as compared to all the other Sone to Grow districts throughout the United States. And on, our, on average, um, students are showing that they are happier um, when compared to students across the district. One of the important reasons um, for Sone to Grow is that when we returned from uh, distance learning and coming back, we didn't know how many of our students are we're gonna need um, help for their social emotional well-being. And in our minds, we thought it was gonna be everybody. And if we put resources, mental health resources for everybody, it actually waters down the system. So this um, Sewn to Grow has allowed us to identify which students really are in need of additional support and which students are doing okay. We were surprised and we didn't know the amount of our students that reported that they are doing okay and that they are coming back. Because we all had different lived experiences, we didn't know what we were gonna get. Um, if we look, the graph on the right are the reflections over time. And so if you look, um, for each month, our students are getting happier as they're in school. So one of the things we like to say is our students definitely are happy to be back in school. And as they adjust socially and back in seats, they're becoming more happy. So that was it's another great graph. Um, we interviewed uh, both students and staff in terms of the use of Sewn to Grow. And so um, we asked about it in some of our student voices. One said, after we re read the feedback, which, is student, which teachers can give them feedback when they write in there why they're feeling, the student said, I know it's very sincere, using her time to type that. And that's helping the student feel accepted and wanted and um, being that they're in class. Another student said, the feedback I get shows my teacher cares about me. And so even though the teacher may not every day um, talk to them, say how you're doing, that feedback that they get, knowing that their teacher's reading what they're saying, is another way of saying we care and we're glad that you're here. Teachers, um, one said one of my students shared that his mom had COVID and he was really anxious. That was the only way I would have known. He only found that space to utilize and share. Thank goodness, otherwise I would have never known. And then another one said the feedback, I'm sorry, I didn't know that, I didn't know that one of my students was really hungry. I was able to refer her to the food pantry. So sometimes students come in class and we don't know why they're behaving or they are the way they are in their moods. And this allows students a way to um, say what's going on in their world. So with that, we are gonna switch to Dibbles and Edel. Um, we use Dibbles and Edel to monitor students' early literacy skills. Dibbles, which stands for Dynamic Indicators of Basic Early Literacy, is a series of short tests that assess the student's acquisition of early literacy skills. And so, what we have on this graph, on our two left-hand side, the bar, the bar graphs are kindergarten. And on the very left is the fall data. Then we have the kindergarten winter. Then we have first grade uh, fall and first grade winter. In kindergarten, in the fall, we test for letter name fluency. This is how well do, can the students recognize letter names. In the winter, we test for um, nonsense word fluency. What this means, for example, dibbles. Dibbles isn't actually an English word. It's a nonsense word. But because I know the phonetics of the English language, I'm able to pronounce dibbles. 
And then it's the same thing for idel in Spanish. It's not an actual Spanish word, but because I have the phonetics, I'm able to pronounce it. So that's an example of a nonsense word, the fluency. Um, if you look, the students are coming in low. And during last year, um, so we have 67% of our students in the, in the fall in kindergarten who are still in the strategic range or intensive range for letter name fluency. And then in the winter for nonsense word, we have 68%. Nonsense word is a little more difficult than just the letter name, but it's still a large amount that are um, in the intensive range. If we look at first grade, we have from um, fall, the nonsense words, to then we go to oral reading fluency. That's the ORF. So in the fall, we do nonsense words with first graders. And then in the winter, we do oral reading fluency, um, and which is a more difficult test than the nonsense words. And we, if you look in first grade, we had a great decrease in the students who are in the intensive range. And we had a 7% increase in students who are core or core negligible. Core negligible means that they're not at risk of falling below grade level and where they should be. And that's what that means. Move on to um, IDEL, which is the, uh, the indicators dinámicos del éxito en la lectura. Um, it's a set of measures for assessing the acquisition of Spanish early literacy skills. Um, like the Dibbles, Edel, uh, the Edel test students in letter name fluency um, and also oral reading fluency and then nonsense words in Spanish. Um, from f fall to winter, kinder students who fell in the intensive band decreased from 55% to 28%. Right? So we're getting, that, we're getting that decrease that we want to see on the Edel, Edel in um, kindergarten. In first grade, we also had a decrease of 14% of our students going from the um, intensive um, from 57 to 43. And then we had an increase of 11% in the core, which is where we want them to be, from 31% to 42% in the first grade. We're going to move to uh, second grade. If we look at these scores, um, first students they go in the fall, they do oral reading fluency in both the fall and the winter. And so it is the same in both Dibbles and Edel on what they are um, assessed. Um, we had a slight decrease in the students in the intensive and um, a slight increase in the students who are core or core eligible. And then on the same thing with the Edel, we had a slight decrease in the intensive and we had a, um, an increase in the students who are at core. Uh, second grade um, students, they were in kindergarten when we went in, when, we, when the whole COVID pandemic hit and they, hit and they went um, into distance learning. And so second grade is one of the grades that we're intensifying our supports and adding things such as the um, instructional associates on the classrooms to make sure that we, we help our, support our students in their reading and their math. We're now going to go to the NWA map. Um, the measures of academic progress. Uh, if you've been, you've seen the um, different ways of reporting the map. Um, tonight we're going over um, the map, looking at the student's RIT score by grade level in reading and math over the last five years. You'll notice a very similar trend in all of the grades as we go through. The blue line represents the test that they take when they take the map in the fall. The orange line represents the, the average RIT score of the student when they take it in the winter. And they'll take it once again in the spring, which we'll be able to compare the spring scores. And we're going to have a large, very large increase in spring. So just so you know, that's my prediction. Um, so if you look um, for second grade reading, um, we, it, we had the trend of increasing. Um, and then the 2020, you'll notice in all of them that there is a large in most of them, there's a large increase. In 2020, students took the, um, last year, they took the MAP assessment at their home, right? So there, there were things that we did to control to make sure that they're in a proper testing environment, but we don't have full control over what happens um, in the home. But as you notice, we are on an upward trend in um, the second grade in the reading. Also in the math, we're on an upward trend. And then once they returned this year in 2021, there was um, a, a, a drop. Um, this is, um, if you look through all of them, 
It's a very similar trend. And by me turning the page, it won't get you to the next slide. Um, Lisa, could you explain what RIT stands for yes, and what RIT, it is? RIT is Roush um, Unit. And so it's to look at the academic performance as well as student growth over time. And so when I take a test, I will ha have a RIT score assigned to me. And I can look at that RIT score in a moment in time to see if whether how I'm doing grade level wise, whether I'm at grade level, whether I'm above or whether I'm below. And then if I look at my RIT score over time, it can tell me whether I am growing at the rate that I should be growing. And so what we did is we took the RIT score average for the entire district of that grade level. So some schools fared better than others, some students fared better than others, but we want to look at the entire district. Um, okay, so it's on fourth, I think. So fourth grade. Um, and so we have our scores here. It's the same thing when we come back. Um, there is that downward turn for this year. Fourth grade reading is the it's that one that it's actually higher than where we started in 2017 tracking it. Um, sixth grade, similar, where we were going on an upward trajectory. And then we had the decline. Math, the curve. Eighth grade. And then ninth grade reading and math. If you're looking at the RIT, RIT score, one of the things that if you notice, as um, a second grader between fall and winter, what well, should increase between 10 and 12 points. Meanwhile, while you get to ninth grade, it's a very small, it's a less, um, less number. It's usually two to four. When you get to 10th grade, it's actually a negative number is the average when you go to fall to winter. So as you increase in grades, the amount that you should be growing decreases. Um, and so then our ninth grade and then uh, our reading and our math. Um, with all the similar scores, one thing that um, we're looking at with it is the uncertainty that has happened this year in terms of the uncertainty of the students who are, are absent due to COVID and we had staff affected as well due to COVID. And then also in the distance learning, it, um, we're looking and that all of our students were not, it was not beneficial to our students. And so there is a gap that we are providing and the supports that we're putting in place. And with the next report, you'll hear about some of the things that we are putting in place with one-time monies and with our LCAP to focus to help um, so we can get back on track to the upward trajectory, which spring, it'll look great. Okay, so now we're gonna um, switch gears and we are now looking at uh, grades. So with, um, this is high school grades with ninth, 10th, and then you'll shortly see 11th and 12th. It is the um, same grade distribution and this is the percentage of, a, percentage of grades given. So if you look at it, this is for first semester. So this is, was for um, the students grade that they just received. Um, if you look at it, where we have A's have the largest percentage, then B's, then C's, then F's, then D's. And it's the same for 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th. To support the 20 to 25% of low grades, um, at the high schools, we currently have two to three UC Santa Cruz Educational Partnership tutors at all three high schools. We have the migrant tutors in place. Um, we also have virtual learning through paper, which you approved earlier this year for our students at the um, all high schools. And then we continue the site wellness teams to catch students who are struggling. Um, and in addition, what we are looking at is we are looking at the effects of the classes that we've added um, to support students' passion, interests, and talents. We continue to add the CTE courses. We continue to add VAPA and also the ethnic studies. So one of the things that we look at is how are students in these other classes faring um, versus um, the traditional classes. On these two um, pie charts, um, what we're looking at is the high school, the CTE core grade dis distribution. So this is any course that is labeled as a CTE course, the distribution of the percent A's, B's, C's, D's, and F's. 
if you look, 75.1% um, of our students, um, they, they have an A through a C, which makes it a college eligible grade in class and they get credit. Um, the other one, all courses, which are not CTE, is the one, the, the pie chart on the bottom. It's 71.1%. Um, and um, with this, what's included in here is physical education. This year, there was a very, very hot, large number of A's in physical education, more than I normally see. And so that is also in the one with all courses. And so that CTE does not have any physical education classes. And they're still doing better. Um, then if we look at the, uh, the English class, uh, the writing for stage and screen, which is one that we put in, 95.8% um, of the students that are taking the course are getting an A, B, or C, which makes it a um, college, the, which they they're, they're get college credit for, and then on to for the transcripts. Um, and then compared to English 1, which is an English class, um, it's 74.5%. And that's the students receiving A through G credit. In looking at the ethnic studies, um, there is a slight GPA difference between the ethnic literature one and the regular English. What we're looking at here is that we, the GPA represents all of the grades given in the class and what the average GPA is for that course. If we look at the world history ethnic studies, it's a much larger GPA difference between the world history ethnic studies and then the world history. Um, one thing I would like to do is put in a plug um, for uh, the ethnic studies. We have a PBSD employee um, who has a student at one of the Aptos ethnic studies um, English lit classes. And that um, employee said that the ethnic literature class has increased their child's writing ability more than any other English class that their child has ever taken. And so, not only is it something that students are interested in, it is um, really supporting the academics of the students in getting ready for college. The last um, thing that we'll be looking at, um, finally, is graduation rates. Um, since 2016-17, graduation rates have steadily increased. Um, last year, the so in 2019-20, that's when we had the hold harmless year. That's the year that we went in and we did the hold harmless. And so students, um, as a reminder, once uh, quarter three hit, students, that's the grade they stayed. They couldn't decrease, it could only increase. And then last year, um, we followed AB 10, um, 104, which we decreased the number of credits for, for seniors to graduate. And 93.45% of our students did um, graduate. So. It is on, I still like to say it is on the upward trend of the graduation rates. And with that, that was a lot of information. Thank you. Any speakers to this item? Yes, we have one speaker. Marilyn Garrett. Education, not radiation. Education, not microwave radiation from all these devices. So this was an interesting uh, presentation here. What I would like to see on that, and I'm going to submit this, is um, talking about children's health. Here's images of red blood cells affected by electromagnetic wireless radiation. And tells about German students doing an experiment where they tested, looked at the blood cells before and after exposure to a cell phone. And they clumped together. Marilyn, I'm just wondering how that relates to the presentation. We're talking about, I just read it here, 
uh, student health. Key indicators to regularly monitor the health of students. So this is key. It's technology that's being used healthy. That's the basic thing. Where is the proof of safety? And I was in this boardroom, different boardroom, years ago when they brought on the wireless technology and I asked the question, is this safe for student health? And the re presenter said, that's not our area of expertise and went on with this presentation on bringing Wi-Fi. Not one board member said, wait a minute, that's the most important thing we need to know, is if something's safe, and it isn't. So I'm gonna leave you this article, and then from this organization called Citizens for Safe Technology, have it wired. Thank you. Thank Attention you. all parents, is Wi-Fi in school making your child sick? So I have enough copies of that for you. Thank you. Now, they were smoking 24-7. You'd see it. When I started teaching in this Thank district, you. they Marilyn. smoked in the teacher's room. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, my dear. OK, Lisa. Um, I'm guessing that um, we have some questions from the board. Does anyone down on this end want to start with any questions? No. Daniel? Just quickly, not to take too much time. Um, is there anything broken down by schools we could take a look at in the future? We can break it down by schools in the future. Okay, so. thank you. Any other comments or questions? I Trustee do. Shocker? So um, we're talking about um, the interventions at the high school level that we've put in place to combat um, the low grades that we're seeing with some of the students. How are we making sure that students are getting to that tutoring, that parents know about that tutoring, that students know about that tutoring, so that we are making sure that they're taking advantage of those supports to graduate and catch up in their classes? So the um, tutors that are on site, which are the educational partnership percent of the UC Santa Cruz um, tutors, they're the ones that do the outreach to students. So they will, because they're on site, they have that ability to work with other counselors and also work with the administration and teachers to go physically get the kids and talk to them and, and, and do that. The paper tutoring, which is the virtual one, um, that, so how paper tutoring, what we're doing is that we're first addressing with the um, 250 students who are on the site wellness team for academics and sites are doing outreach and the paper tutoring company themselves are actually working with school sites to do the outreach to calling and all of the um, materials, uh, the advertisements and the materials um, and there's YouTube videos to get it out to parents. And so we are doing also um, like almost a commercial to make sure that the students are getting on for the paper tutoring. Because that's the one that we don't have as much control over when they do it because it is 24 seven that the students have access which is a great access um, it's just making sure that they do utilize it. So Trustee Shocker, I'm just gonna also ask um, Ms. Chaus to speak to also what the counselors are doing and um, the wellness teams and other efforts. Sure, so uh, a couple of things that are going on in terms of how are we capturing kids. Um, likewise, as we've done in the past two years during distance learning, each counselor has met with every senior. So anybody that was already off track, we've met with. Uh, they did individual plans with each student to say, what are the state requirements that they need to make sure that they actually hit those marks first? And then in addition, any others that would be at the 220 mark that, that would be warranted. So um, as Ms. Geary spoke, underneath 104, it's still at the 130 level. This is the last year that that is in play. So really kind of looking at the kids and making sure that they hit the state requirements first reseeding them in that or getting them into credit recovery. Um, we had a very robust winter session for credit recovery um, and we expect to have another robust uh, spring. So we're looking at just about 700 kids that have one or other class uh, across district wide. Um, and about half of those at this point are now moving into to credit recovery for those classes. We're focusing on the state requirements first to make sure that they are able to graduate um, and then moving forward from there. But 
Um, huge shout out, and I'd be remiss if I didn't, to our counselors for meeting with each one of the kids. Those contract pieces also include the parent contact so that the parent knows whether the student may be in jeopardy of not graduating as well. Uh, so that's kind of another fold in to help motivate students to, to have different opportunities to make up that class. Uh, in terms of site wellness, our teams are still running site wellness. So as Ms. Aguirre presented, you'll see that academic piece kind of uh, peak. Their rigor level has gone up in terms of classes, so they are feeling that piece as well. Um, but you can also see the pieces that are high. Uh, you know, we have higher substance abuse and stress anxiety right now as well. So coupling those pieces, we focused a lot on the connection that they have with school and keeping them connected to the adults that care about them in the school. So huge motivating factor when you know somebody cares about you versus not. So really focusing on that connection to keep them um, engaged. What I will say is that the ones that may be struggling in that CD band are showing up uh, more, more robustly than they initially were. So as we get closer, it's also not uncommon to see seniors pull stuff off that we didn't think that they could pull off at times. So there's a little piece of that that is historical uh, across the board. So when we're talking about one or two classes, I would say if they went to credit recovery at this point, um, and again, we'll have some summer grads as well, they would likely be able to finish at least three classes if they were motivated. So it's about 15 credits before the end of the school year in addition to their normal classes. Thank you very much for sharing that. My next question is, if we go back to the, like our um, map, right? So if we take out our 2020 data, right, which is an, an anomaly because like you said, it's at home, we don't know, sister helping, whatever. <laughs> it's, it's, hard, it's a hard environment to control. Um, so if we look, take 2020 out, trajectory wise, where we're at now is not too far off where we were prior to COVID, correct? Yes, that so. is correct with students in school, 100% of the time. Okay, and that is across the board um, with the MAP scores pretty much, or? Yes. If you look at fourth grade um, reading, it's actually above than where we were in the, in the winter okay. and also the fall. Um, and then our math scores are improving. Um, I know those kind of took a hit, but those look like they are improving um, slowly yes they are also slowly um, except for sixth sixth grade we see some problems but it's still above when we look at the winter test we're still um where we were where we were yes. okay and are we having extra supports in place for the middle schoolers right now also um for the middle school what you see we're going to be adding um in the next presentation okay with the <laughs> we'll be adding um some supports but we also have um counselors that are on the, the middle school and they also have site wellness teams as well. And so they use the same process that the high school does when they have students that are, um, are not doing well. Um, in different sites too, for example, they'll take the, um, the map data and they'll go through it and they'll comb it and they'll actually look um, by student by student and they'll go through and they'll make plans, students make plan, they look at it and that's part of what, um, what we're doing to also empower the students to say like this was your trajectory and we can get you back up there. Okay. And also with our map, we were partnering with Khan Academy, right? So the, yes, the, the kids math accelerator. with the math. So the kids that are struggling, they are having lessons that are targeted to them through that. Portion That's absolutely of them. Correct. correct. So as students are taking it and their their where their RIT score falls, it places them into um, the map accelerator based on their score. And so the the lessons that are delivered to them through Khan Academy is where they're supposed to be. Um, and what they need to fill in their gaps. That's absolutely correct. Okay. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, just really briefly, going back to um, Trustee Dodge's request, I think having data by school site, I think would be helpful, but also um, having data uh, for English language learners and students with yeah subgroups i think would be very helpful for us um so going back to the wellness teams and referrals um was a turnaround time for them to for students to who are referred to receive services or additional supports it's pretty fast um wellness teams the expectation is that they're meeting weekly 
Okay. And so depending on the severity and what the actual case is that the, the staff, because it, because it is monitored by the school site, it's a fast turnaround where they're not waiting on someone from the outside to support and help. Great. And then as far as accessing um, academic counselors or additional tutoring um, on site through um, our career centers and so forth, are, have there been any issues with waiting times for students to access them? We have additional heard, help. We haven't heard, and uh, if there is, any, we haven't heard from students that there is um, waiting time. But we can look into that to see. That would be good. This is great. Thank you. I, I was just going to say I did have some questions, but I feel like they got answered. It was um, kind of leaping off of um, what Trustee Judge said about how. Um, it is because I figured, of course, you could break this down by school all the way down to by the student. And I think you and Ms. Shells have answered that sufficiently for me tonight. Um, but and I think it is important for us to look at how that we are doing it as a district as a whole. So thank you for your presentation. Thanks for this presentation. <clears throat> um, there's, it's, there's a lot to learn here and a lot to study. And so I do still feel like we need a special study session because I have a lot more questions than I, you want to answer tonight. Um, but the ones that I'd like answered tonight is if you could go to the slide that shows the graduation rate again. So do we have any, I'm, I know you do, because you have this data at your fingertips, uh, probably at your desk, but do you have any sense of how our graduation rate compares to the state and national average? Or I, even county? Yeah, I have that at my desk. I you don't do, have yeah, here. okay. So that's something I'd like to know. Okay. I think the public should know that. Um, but that's a nice number compared to years past, so. Yes. Congratulations, yeah, on getting that up. And then um, you said something about supports, including instructional associates, and I have no idea. I've never heard that. Assistance. Assistance. As, uh, sorry, assists. Uh, like assistance. aids. Yeah, IAs. IAs. Okay. IAs. So we're, are we putting more IAs in to support students than we ever have before? Or? Yes, we did. We, yeah. we have put more IAs than we um, earlier. Yeah, for, for the start of the school year and mm -hmm. at the elementary school sites. And they are not only are, have we increased the number that we have, we're also doing professional development with them where they come and they learn with the different um, curriculums and the SIPs, like the fluency to work with students. So um, we brought on more instructional IAs How? and also increase with the um, professional development that they're receiving as well. So it's not just they're there in the classroom too. That's kind of great. I think our teachers have been asking for that for a yes. long time. Yes. So, so the expectation is yeah. there and also to support the yeah. learning. That's great. And then um, under the, I, I had the same concern about, I'd like to see the breakdown by individual schools. So I, so we know, Okay. and, and subgroups would be good. Um, and again, um, when you're averaging out, like when I'm looking at the scores, I'd like to know how that averages out, um, not averages out, but how that compares to state and national averages and you know, similar demographic districts. I think that would be helpful. Um, and then if you, is this the, if you could go back to the slide that uh, talked about grades. Which one? Um, this, I think. So we have the ninth and 10th grade grades here and then we have the 11th, 12th grade here. And then we have the CTE. Yeah, so maybe it was those last two slides. Okay. I'm wondering how did how did these differ from years past? Do you have any sense? Pretty consistent. Pretty consistent. Okay. Okay, so I think we all expected um, some dips in our progress that we were so excited about considering COVID and uh, that's not a surprise and I don't think we were expecting anything different so it's just a small yeah blip. yeah we'll be back up there okay 
Um, and then in terms of counselors in the middle school, I thought we only had part-time counselors. Do we have full-time counselors now in the middle school with for increased funding? Uh -huh. Yeah, so we have one social-emotional counselor at each middle school now, and we have at least one academic counselor. It depends on their size, but they have at least one academic and one social-emotional. Oh, that's great. We increased the ratios this past, this beginning of this year. That's wonderful. Okay, I think that's all. Thank you very much. But you don't leave because you're up next with our <laughs> LCAP update report. So we'll move on to item 8.2. All right, thank you again. Good evening, President de Serpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. I'm not sure why the apple moved down, um, but the, the fruit is ready to be picked, is what, it, what it's saying. Um, okay. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so, the, the, I'm here to present the um, LCAP mid year um, report. And so a little background is that the section 124E of Assembly Bill 130 requires all LEAs to present an update on the annual, um, annual update to the 21 to 22 LCAP for this year, looking at some metrics, some of the metrics you've, you just saw in the previous um, presentation, as well as expenditures that we either had to reconfigure or we haven't spent yet. Um, and so tonight I will be going through um, the different LCAP goals, where we are with some of the metrics and where we are with some of the expenditures. In addition, um, we have to, um, we're also looking, this is the, the parent um, budget, the, um, and also looking at where we had an increase in concentration grants. And so last June, when you approved the LCAP as well as the July budget, um, the Budget Act of 2021 had not yet been approved. And what this did is it actually increased the amount of funding to schools, whether it was through one-time funds or what we had an, um, also, we had a major increase in the LCFF supplemental concentration grant monies. And so tonight we're also gonna be talking about the, with the increase, the 5.5 million increase in the concentration supplemental um, grant monies, what it is that we um, are going to be doing with the money. So the supplement to the um, LCAP, which was included in the board packet, um, there were five areas for a written response. Um, the first one is um, how did we engage with educational partners um, on the use of funds provided through the Budget Act of 2021 that were not included in the LCAP that you approved. Um, a description on how we plan on using the additional concentration grant add-on funding. Um, and then the third area is um, how we engaged with our community partners on the use of one-time federal funds received intended to support the recovery of the COVID-19 pandemic and the impact of distance learning. The fourth area um, is how we're implementing how the, the successes and the challenges of the implementation of the Federal American Rescue Plan Act and the Federal Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief, which are ESSERs, ESSER 1, 2, and 3s. And then finally, um, how we are um, using its fiscal resources received for the 21-22 school year in a manner that's consistent with the board approved 21-22 um, LCAP. So in the um, first area, which is how we engage with our educational partners, um, we listened to the voices of our stakeholders from surveys and meetings that took place from March 2021 to January 2022. These meetings included things such as school site council, English language advisory committee, district advisory committee, uh, the district English learning, learner advisory committee, the community advisory committee, migrant parent advisory committee, Migrant and Seasonal Head Start Policy Committee, Child Development Parent Advisory Committee, Town Halls, Thought Exchange, Student Meetings, and Bargaining Unit Meetings where we asked how we want to spend the, the funds that we are receiving. Um, the second area where we're looking at um, how we're gonna spend the additional 5.5 million in the concentration add-on funding, um, and the funding must be used to increase the number, so it's strict, so the number of staff 
who provide direct services to students at schools campuses with an enrollment of 55% or higher unduplicated students. So the unduplicated students are students that are socioeconomically disadvantaged, English learners, and or foster youth. And so we'll be adding a counselor to service students and families in the newcomer program and the International Academy. Additional FTE to middle school for English language development acceleration. Additional FTE to high school for English language development acceleration. Additional FTE at Watsonville High School specifically to teach within the newcomer program. Reading and math specialists at the middle schools. I'm going to increase the number of maintenance specialists. Additional school parent liaisons to increase parent engagement. Um, and additional socio-emotional counselors at the secondary schools, both middle and high schools. This was based on the feedback that we received through our different meetings and our surveys. Um, area three asks how we engage educational partners with the use of one-time federal funds, which are your SR1, SR2, SR3, in-person instruction, and expanded learning grants. Um, you'll see that we had different um, meetings and also different surveys, and in, which included the weekly conversations with the superintendent where Dr. Rodriguez goes to different school sites and engages with the staff. Area four is the success and challenges of the implementation of the ESSER three plan. Um, so some of the success successes that we had was the expanded arts through El Sistema, the expanded outdoor science education through Life Lab, expanded and enhanced school-based counseling, which is the um, expansion with our contract with PVPSA, additional social emotional counselors, and um, the addition of mental health clinicians. Um, EAOP contract for academic supports at um, middle schools, some of our middle schools and high schools. Addition of instructional aids at the elementary um, schools, IAs. Robust summer learning program and the opening of the Family Wellness and Engagement Center. Some of the challenges that we've had in the implementation um, is the balancing of the LCAP, which was we, we wrote the LCAP we earmarked monies, and then we received one-time funds. So it was the balancing of the LCAP spending with the one-time um, monies that we received, the hiring of staff to fill positions. So we know we have a need for certain positions to support our students, um, but it's the hiring to find the, the people to put in the place where we had some challenges. Unreliable substitute pool for both certificated and classified. Um, as we know, it's been a challenging year. And then also the implementation of the changing CDHP protocols, which um, have changed quite a bit as through the school year. Those were some of our challenges. And the last area is how we're using fiscal resources consistent with the LCAP. Um, all monies um, that we, whether it was through one-time grant or the additional add-on of the concentration, um, are aligned um, to one of the seven LCAP goals. Um, with the implementation of, and this is just a, a short list and a, a very broad list of the things that we have put in place, the expanded professional development, family engagement, additional materials and curriculum, additional personnel and extended hours of personnel, the purchase of additional PPE, outdoor seating so that students can be outside and eat and gather, facility repairs and safety improvements, and community partnerships to expand academic Opportunities, enrichment, and extended learning time. If we look through our LCAP, um, the mid-year metrics, there's three different buckets that they can fall into. The metrics, which is what we look at to see how we are doing in terms of what we want to achieve with our goals. Um, so one of them is that the outcome is unknown. Um, one is outcomes in progress, we don't have data, and the last one is the outcome is known. There are lots of metrics within the LCAP. Some of them have been presented um, throughout this year. Some of them presented in the previous presentation. And I have um, a few that will be upcoming. The second thing we're going to look at is the LCAP expenditures and implementation. Um, and so with our expenditures and um, implementation, we said we we're going to earmark a certain amount of money to do this. And so whatever action that is that we said that we were going to do, it could be whether that it wasn't started, it's in progress, or it's not completed. So this evening, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over the areas where that, that we had to either reconfigure expenditures, either because we used one-time um, money or that there's been a delay due to 
a reason, whether it's because we couldn't meet in person or whatever it is. And so those are the areas that I am going to highlight. So the first LCAP goal is that by 2024, we're going to increase the number of TK-12 students performing at grade level um, or above. And the high schoolers completing A through G coursework to prepare all students to graduate from PV, UP, PVUSD life, career, and college ready. So that's our first goal. Um, some of the metrics, um, we look, we have MAP. And if you look on here, some of it is broken out by um, demographics. This is a percent of students making one year's academic growth. The first column is where our baseline was when the LCAP was written. The um, middle column is where we want to be at the end of the 2023-24 school year. And the third column is where we currently are based on our last um, scores or whatever it is. So this is actually in progress because we will, students will take another test in spring, and that's where we can really see where our students are growing and how many are making a um, year's progress. Um, so Lisa, yep. if I could just have yeah. you go back to that. I think so for me, when you look at the mid-year update, you guys were asking previously about the subgroups. What we have found that the pandemic and distance learning affected vulnerable student groups at a higher level than other students. It also affected our students more as they got older. So um, we had some significant challenges in terms of literacy for our K-1, but then when you look at MAP growth and the negative impact of distance learning, you see it much more at the higher levels, um, and you'll see it here, right? So you'll see that um, when you look at the percentage that were proficient in making great progress, um, whether it's socioeconomically disadvantaged or students with disabilities, you'll see the significant downshift that we had. And so that's why we are putting in so many things in place, whether it's the intervention teachers or the instructional assistants, um, right? Because we need to, what is bringing down the district-wide numbers is just a disproportionate impact um, that it had on vulnerable populations. Um, so we saw that in our families and we're seeing that in our students as well. So Michelle, with that, since we're talking about this, in that center column where it says desired outcomes, like why why wouldn't we put 100%? Don't we want 100% of our kids to have the desired outcome? We do, but when you look psychometrically at what progress realistically can be made, we can make the 60% um, by the 23-24 school year. Um, and so that's not our end result, but that is the result of where we want to get ourselves back to, um, especially knowing that we saw a downward trajectory, and so we're having to um, rebound back um, and get back to where we were. So when you look at the trajectories that we had, um, we were go we be we have been going up for the last four years, unfortunately. Um, as in most school districts, um, the distance learning, although everyone did a valiant effort, it was a challenging year. So people, our students came back um, at a lower rate, and then at this point, um, it's been harder for them to rebound back, and everyone's making um, a great effort to do that, but yeah. Th Thank those you. numbers will increase at, with the next LCAP cycle because we will reach those, and then you increase it more. Um, so we got another one is, so for example, if an outcome is unknown, is the SBAC, the CAS test that students take. Um, we did not take the test last year, so that's why there's outcome is unknown. Um, then on the bottom, we have the percent of high school students who agree or strongly agree that their school has helped understand this, the steps needed in order to have their career that they wanted. And if we look, the majority of um, our students um, in the subgroups, it increased. Um, and so... Our, our, what we're doing with the schools, with the students, and looking at their futures, um, it's showing that it is working. Um, and then if we look at the reconfigured expenditures and identified delays, in, um, there was $25,000 earmarked for early childhood, and um, this action item has not started. It will be starting. Um, there's a couple different things. They're um, aligning 
uh, the the student work, the, the curriculum, and how the ECE aligns pushing up through to TK, as well as looking at different um, social emotional programs for students that works for um, the younger students. Um, the second thing is the culturally responsive classroom and teaching. Um, we have not spent very much money in this area. The action is delayed due to the sub shortage and outside. So the sub shortage is number one. And so we had a series for um, teachers and administrators to take. We did delay that because it's better, especially with this, to do it in person than it is to do it online because it really is about learning who you are as a, an educator so that you can help students who may or may not look like you, right? So you have to know your own biases and that, and that is really done better in person than it is online. The second thing is that there was an outside contract with our community resource education, the CRE through the ethnic studies that was paid with um, one-time funds. Uh, college and career development, action 1.9, um, that's our EAOP contract. So within the LCAP, we place that in there. That was paid through one-time um, one funds. And then the, the foster youth, it's in progress. What happens is part of our services for our foster youth, we work through the Santa Cruz County Office of Ed and they um, invoice us at the end of the year. So these, this is in progress, the work is being done, which just it hasn't been invoiced. So if you, when you look at the budget, it doesn't show that it, it was, um, any money was spent. It's just a quick question, on the e EAOP, is that just for one year or is that f a multi-year contract? The EAOP, um, the one point, I believe it's one year. Just for, it's a one year. Yeah, it's a yeah, one year. Okay, yeah. yeah, wow, okay, thanks. So LCAP goal two is that ensure um, Parha Valley, and I won't read the whole thing, but it provides Parha Valley Unified provides, Julie wants me to? All right, by 2024, ensure that Parha Valley Unified provides career technical education, CTE, pathways that are aligned to high scale, high demand, high wage professions with our regional industry ecosystem, and that also affirm as strengths our students' lived experiences, resilience and persistent, persistence, inherent student cultural capital and persistence, leading to a habit of lifelong learning and post-secondary options, which include four and two year colleges, technical training and or certification based employment. This is, um, Director Julie Edwards, um, who uh, oversees this LCAP goal, and um, she wrote that goal, and it's, it is beautiful. So some of the metrics that we have in place, if we look, um, all of them, we have progress, great progress in all areas. You've heard um, many updates with the CTE work going on. Um, if you look, the first one, we're at 98% completion, where we have minimum of two A through G designated course sequence reflecting standards aligned curriculum and state CalPads aligned courses where our desired outcome for 23-24 was 90%, so we are actually ahead. So this is one that will, yeah, it, yes, exactly. We'll <laughs> change it to 100. Where we were last year is 25%, um, and that outcome is known. Um, the next two we do have, if you look, we also have um, progress on the, the, the middle one, and that's in progress. And then the last one, the career technical education student leadership opportunities. And this one, um, part of the reason why it's not higher is because of the in-person opportunities aren't there quite there yet. But there are progress in all, and even though that our students aren't going to the events in progress, um, Julie has them all earmarked of exactly where they will be going as soon as it, everything opens up. Uh, so reconfigured expenditures and identified delays. Um, and so the action hasn't started, the first one. Um, where we're looking at adding a graphic design and product innovation. There's pre-work that is being done, but the, where we need to spend the monies has not yet taken place. Um, pathway exploration at new school. The action is in progress, but no expenditures also has, um, needs to happen. And the last one is the professional development, and you'll see this um, throughout that the professional development, that's an area that we haven't spent as much money because usually it's spent on subs or um, extra time for teachers and because we don't have the in-person ability um, that we, ha we haven't had to spend the money on subs. And that's the one thing that we're trying to do with professional development is not take them out of the classroom. So LCAP goal three, by 2024 to develop students' talents, passions, and interests. All TK-12 students will have access to the arts as part of our commitment to the whole child learning and development. Um, this is an area that we've been working on uh, for quite some time, have added quite a bit of 
programs like um, Save the Music. I saw a great Save the Music class today um, and different adding um, choir and um, band at our middle school and high schools um, and different opportunities for students. So we want to increase. So some of the, the metrics, if we look, um, this is where there is 100 percent the desired outcome at the end. Um, the first one percent of elementary students with access to visual and performing arts through a teacher outside of their primary teacher. And this has increased. Um, we are adding more Save the Music teachers. Um, and so this is an area that has increased. The outcome is known because we know who our staff are and we know where our students are going during the day. Second one is the percent of secondary students with access to VAPA courses. Um, with the ability to take multiple courses in a given discipline repeatedly, which means um, I, I'm, my, I'm forced to take band for some reason, right? And then I find out that I'm falling in love with playing the saxophone and I want to continue. And next year I want to go to intermediate band or advanced band. So having that um, strand at the same school site where I can continue my passion, and that's what this one is, um, this metric is talking about. Um, we're, we're the same this year. Um, the outcome is known, and we are looking, and um, our coordinator of APA, Sue Gralti, is working with school sites to figure out how we can make sure that those strands do exist where students can continue their passion. Some of the reconfigured expenditures and identified delays. Um, the first one is the elementary visual and performing arts, um, and this is looking at the professional development within um, the, for the VAPA teachers. This one, it hasn't started due, there was, um, we were gonna do a lot of professional development, but because of sub shortage, um, and we didn't wanna pull the teachers from the school day. Um, the second one's El Sistema. El Sistema, we, this is completed, but we used one-time um, money to purchase the action item. And the last one is the Latino Film Institute Youth Cinema Proje Project, which we also used one-time monies. LCAP goal four is ensure educational needs are met for all students by providing engaging 21st century learning environments, appropriately credentialed teachers, and quality standards and lines, instructional materials through fiscally solvent practices. This is really where we look at our Williams, which the report came earlier, where we're looking at instructional materials, school sites, um, conditions, um, and as well as if we have properly um, credentialed teachers within the classroom. Also within, um, yeah. So then if we look, we have um, for the first one is looking at the facilities where we want to decrease the number of instances. So this one is backwards. The lower the number is um, the better number. So we did decrease just a little bit and we want to get down to 20%. So it's the number of instances where facilities do not meet the good repair. So this is the lower percentage is the better. Uh, the outcome is known. Um, the, miss, uh, the second one is the California Dashboard Indicator Basics of Misassignments for teachers who teach English learners. Um, this one we're at 0%, which is great. And the last one is the percent of classroom assignments filled on the first day of school. And as we know, that did decrease because we did not have all of our, our positions filled. Some of the reconfigured expenditures and identified delays. Um, so the first one is core instructional materials. Uh, this year, we had earmarked um, monies for uh, elementary science adoption, um, curriculum adoption, as well as high school English curriculum adoption. Both of them were started in progress, but because of the pandemic, um, we delayed both of them and we will be um, adopting them in the near, near future. So the money that was set aside to pay for the adoption that we need for both elementary science and also for high school English is, is delayed. And so that's in progress, but it is just delayed and we'll be doing it next year. Um, but we still need to have that money set aside. School libraries, it's where we want to improve our school libraries with um, facilities to have places for students to go to after school as well as having library books. This is completed, but we use one-time funds. Um, and the last one is the 21st century learning tools. This is something where you heard about the innovation tech coaches who go out, work with school sites, have, um, the virtual 3D goggles, which have grease, green screens, different items of that sort. Um, in this case, um, our technology coaches are all in the classroom teaching. And so this one is not started because um, they're not in, able to go out to the school sites this year. LCAP goal five. 
The LCAP Goal 5 um, looks at our long-term English learners, and it's um, we want to make sure that they're demonstrating at least one year of progress towards English fluency, and then we want to decrease the number of long-term English learners. So if you look at the metrics, um, for our English learner reclassification rate, this one's in progress. We are currently um, holding LPAC tests on all of our school sites. This is our spring annual one to figure out, to find out how many of our students have progressed in English so that they become reclassified. Um, and so our baseline last year, we had 7% English learner reclassification rate, and we're projected to hit 10%. And so this is in the pandemic, and so it is in progress, and we'll know more in spring. The second one is the number of students who have access to all course offerings. And so this decreased a little bit, um, but we are uh, finding ways that, more creative ways that our students have access to all course offerings. Um, and the last one is the number of students receiving the Seal of Biliteracy Award. Uh, as you know, this is one that has increased. Um, our Director of State and Fed in English Language Services, um, Michael Berman, has done a great job in terms of reaching out to counselors, to students, to families, to try to grab as many students as, and, and talk to them about um, going through the process to get the biliter Biliteracy Award. There is some onus on the student to complete paperwork, and so he really is working with the counselors. Um, last year, we had 148 students, which decreased a little bit. Um, and then this year, we're projected to hit 165, which is great. So it, it is, it is an a increase in what we've done. And so we're moving closer to our goal. Reconfigured expenditures and identified delays in this area for LCAP Goal 5. Um, all of our expenditures that we identified are being spent appropriately. Um, and so there is nothing that we can say that where we're not spending the funds. LCAP Goal 6. This is where um, we look at the school campuses. Um, we want to create a culture where all adults provide a safe, supportive, and positive school environment grounded in culturally and linguistically responsive teaching that encourages positive behavior, provides more opportunities for students' sense of connectedness, and increases engagement. So this is really looking at how our students are feeling on school site, looking at suspensions, expulsions, and what we have in place to support the students' well-being. Uh, and so some of the metrics. Um, the first one is the PBIS. It's the number of schools scoring high enough on the tiered fidelity inventory, the T TFI, to be recognized by the World um, Coalition of PBIS um, at the bronze level or higher. So the bronze is the lowest level that you can be recognized, and some bronze, silver, gold. Um, and so we have um, had a large increase of a number of our schools that have been recognized. We're almost hitting our goal. So we're at, last year we had 26 of our schools recognized um, by the PBIS World um, Coalition. So the outcome is known. Um, and then we are working with the, the, the rest of the schools to see if we can get all of our schools 100%. We had 28, but we really want to be 31. Um, the second metric in this one is the percent of middle school students who agree or strongly agree when they are feeling upset, stressed, or having problems. Their school has programs or services that can help them. And if we look at this, it shows that the, the services that we've put in, mo for most of our subgroups, it has increased saying, yes, that I do agree or strongly agree with this statement. Um, we're gonna, and what, we're, what we would like is to have this increase even more. Um, but the majority of them, with the English learner dropping 1%, um, but there is an, an, an increase. In. So the reconfigured expenditures and identified delays, this is where um, a lot of one-time funds were used. So the first thing is the Family Engagement and Wellness Center. Um, it was written in the LCAP, but we used one-time um, funds for this action item. It's completed. Um, PBIS. We used um, one-time funding, um, multi-tiered systems of support. Um, this is completed, and we use one-time um, funding. The community resource and counseling. This is our partnership with PVPSA, one-time money. Um, and then the drug and alcohol prevention. Um, this was also used, completed with one-time funds. And the last goal which is increased parent and family engagement in their children's education through a variety of opportunities 
that promote greater parent capacity and empowerment by adding opportunities throughout the school district. Um, the Parent Engagement Center um, is doing a great job with our online. We notice that more we have more parent participation online. In looking at the metric, what we noticed there was a decline in the percent of um, parents who agree or strongly agree that they're engaged with their, their children's school. And if you think about it uh, from a parent's perspective, oh, sorry, I was, I was turning my pages thinking that it automatically goes. Um, <laughs> if you, um, from, a, from a parent's perspective, um, the, the, it, it feels different. In, when non-COVID times, you could go on campus, you can engage with your child's teacher, you can talk to the office, you can volunteer, you can go on field trips. And when we were in distance learning, it was one thing to say, you know, you could see the teacher online every day, right? You could, you could see that or talk to your student about it or see them. Now that we're back in school as a parent, our previous experience is not the same. And it's a little weird as a parent to feel like, you know, I've actually maybe seen my child's teacher once this entire year. But it's because we don't have the volunteer opportunities or the field trips because of the pandemic. And so there was, and it shows in the decrease in the parents who say that they feel engaged with their child's school because there aren't those opportunities. And once we, um, once we switch and it feels more like normalcy, these numbers will go back up. So some of the reconfigured expenditures, and this goes along with it, um, the first thing is the family engagement plan. Part of it is that we want to work with the family engagement um, services wanted to work with school sites to create a family engagement plan by school, right? So they come up and they said, how many, what are you gonna do to engage your parents? What opportunities and activities are you gonna have on your school site where parents and families and guardians can come and participate? But because of we're still in the COVID times, this has not yet been allowed to happen, but there is money earmarked for that. Um, and then the other thing is the college and career night. We wanna increase, we had college and career uh, day that turned to week, that's gone to two weeks. And so this year we also added the um, college and career night for family um, families. And so there was money earmarked, but this was done through a virtual platform and not in person. So we didn't need any, um, any funding for, for this event. And so those were the two in the oil cap full seven. And in closing, um, the challenges of hiring staff, implementing health and safety protocols and addressing learning acceleration needs due to the impact of distance learning has presented many challenges as we return to in-person learning. But we are still committed to the LCAP to provide the necessary student, uh, services to our students. And we would like to acknowledge and thank um, our, the hard work and dedication of all of our employees, certificated and classified, the support of our parents and community, and the resilience of our students to ensure all students graduate college, career, and life ready. It's been an interesting journey over the last two years. Thank you, Lisa. Do we have any speakers to this item? We do not. Okay, any questions or um, comments from the board? Trustee Holm? Um, I'm wondering if we have any data around, because um, we've been talking about the impact of you know, distance learning, et cetera. Do we have any data from the maybe school district that had the same kind of transmission rates as our area, but maybe didn't go to distance, you know, or, or like just, I'm, I'm thinking about like the impacts, because I know some districts in say like New York. So outside they tried, of California. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they tried to stay open, but then they had to close and then they opened and there was a lot of back and forth. Do we have any data around the impacts on their learning goals? We probably could use MAP because MAP is yeah. national level data okay. and try to find something aligned with that. Um, because we aren't doing SBAP, we don't have any national level data right. other than MAP, um, but we could investigate that. Mm -hmm. um, definitely in other states, they had um, differing experiences yeah. of their amount of closure for sure. And that would be just good data for us to have as things develop. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So the LCAP was written at the beginning of the school year, right? The, no, the LCAP was written last year and board approved June 23rd, 2021. Okay, but it was for this school year. It's for this school year. It goes from 20, the beginning of the school year, mm -hmm. the year 23, 24. Okay, so I know we got some extra money coming in and 
um, is there is there anything there left over or all every dollar of it is now allocated every dollar of it is now allocated okay and the in the March the next board meeting um, there will be a budget presentation um, where it will go through okay sounds good any other questions from this side it was a lot of information and it was very thorough okay okay thank you okay Lisa. thank you yeah. <laughs> okay we are on uh section nine which is action items um the next presentation is 9.1 the 2021 comprehensive school safety plan presented by assistant superintendent Kristen Schaus. Good evening, Board President Serpa, uh, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. A couple of, of beautiful people up there. You can see that's actually part of our ALICE team that's been doing trainings throughout the district. I have the pleasure of giving you an opportunity to see a little closer into the comprehensive school safety plan process. So every year uh, by ed code, we're required to review safety plans. That level of review has to happen at the site level. Also includes a law enforcement review and district office review. Those have to be submitted by March 1st every year. Uh, each school has to then forward that to you guys as the district or the county office. So what you'll sometimes see is the smaller districts will use county offices. Larger districts tend to use their own districts to be able to approve those. And then they move on to the CDE. Um, I can verify that we have all of them. So we are not going to need, need to notify the CDE that we have any schools missing at this point. A Couple of things that, that I want to kind of point out as we go through, I know that several of you guys are familiar with them. Doc tracking, and I just noticed that our cursor doesn't actually work up there. So if you look at the upper left-hand side up there, you'll see doc tracking. Doc tracking is a system that we use for multiple plans. It actually includes our LCAP, our single plan for student achievement, um, various different plans that have compliance measures that need to be hit. Uh, within that document, it allows us to clearly see the guidelines of what's in ed code so that we can ensure that we've met all of those pieces. A couple of pieces that you'll notice at the top left hand side, just underneath doc tracking, you'll see part one. So comprehensive school safety plans come in two parts. Part one is open to the public. Uh, by that, I mean that it's allowed to be presented on their websites. Um, You'll see several different pieces, but the highlights of part one really are around board policy um, and what the rules and regulations uh, of the schools are in general. A uh, few things that folks may sometimes misconstrue. Uh, you'll see that little first uh, orange arrow up there, current status of school crime. They're not actually referring to school crime as legal or penal code crime. They're actually referring to office discipline referrals, um, you know, some of the various pieces up there with the tenants. We don't code it that way, the CDE codes it that way, so I just wanna make sure you guys know that is not um, us looking at school crime in that capacity. It does require schools to put forward how many kids have been suspended. Um, uh, what does the California Healthy Kids Survey say? What does your Youth Truth Survey say? So they do need to make sure that they bring forward any of the discipline actions that have occurred on their campus, and then what kind of those remediations looked like. Another piece you'll see up there is the Emergency Disaster Preparedness Training Schedule. A little insert there as well. Requires them, every drill that's required by ed code needs to be listed there with the dates of either completion or proposed completion of when they're gonna hit those. Um, if you reviewed last year's, which I know you did, you would have seen that we were in hiatus. We were during COVID time, kids were not with us. So those drills actually indicated uh, on hold until COVID closure opens up. Uh, you'll see that each one of those has now been resumed. So you will see that drills have started to occur again. And those earthquake drills, fire drills, those pieces are now happening for our kids in our sites again. And then lastly, you'll see the last one uh, of the orange pullout there in arrow, uh, positive school climate. Those are gonna be all of your PBIS pieces. Um, that is not inclusive, so you would open up the file, that's just a short version of uh, you know what you would see in a snippet. So from PBIS, tier one and tier two supports, but that's really where a school would put in what's happening on the preventative side or what are they using for their PBIS module pieces uh, to support students. You'll see at the bottom there again that those are posted publicly to school sites uh, based on approval. This is part two. So you'll see that upper left hand corner again right underneath doc tracking. 
Part two, and uh, I'll, I'll probably say this twice, I wanna make sure that everybody knows this, in, in all transparency, there's a reason why part two is not disclosed to the public. Uh, in part two, it includes staging and assembly areas, reunification areas, site and evacuation maps, uh, identification of disabled individuals, uh, location of shutoff valves, control panels, and blueprints of buildings. All things that also fell into the wrong hands actually put us in a poor situation uh, with staff, students, and first responders. So part two is actually undercover. Um, by that, it's, it's meant that the district can see it, the sites have access to be able to see their own plans as well, uh, but in terms of publication to the larger mass, those are not uh, disclosed. Uh, part one, uh, again, you'll see upon approval, that would go up on websites. This year, we're also gonna have principals make sure that their parents are aware of them. So whatever their normal form of communication is, whether that's a newsletter, their memos, their pushouts through PAs, they'll, they'll notify their parents that part one is also up and posted to their websites. Uh, within the board docs, I put three samples. That's typical of what we have done in the past. We put one from elementary school, uh, middle school, and a high school. Um, you'll also see over on my desk, we have all of them in person as well. So we ran them in hard copies uh, just to make sure that you also have assurances that they've all been done. And with that, staff is recommending that you move those forward for approval so that I can get them off to CDE. Are there any speakers to this item? None. Any questions or comments from the board? Uh, Trustee Dodge. Thank you very much, President DeSerpa. Um, attached are three samples of part one, one from each grade level, Valencia, Rolling Hills, and Pajaro Valley uh, High School. Was that this year? Yes, so all of those are current. So each one of the three that I attached to the board docs will be the current years that went through. Okay. Um, you know, thank you for the report. It, it was a good report, but uh, I was just wondering, why weren't any schools from my area, Trustee Acosta or Trustee Soto's schools involved in any of this training for this year? So everybody's involved in the training. Each one of the sites is required to go through the process. They are, uh, you know, on my desk, I do bring them forward. You're welcome to be able to, to review each one of your schools as well. We just randomly actually pick samples. Last year I picked three different samples. It include EDA Hall, uh, Watsonville yeah. High, I believe, and another one. And um, not to step on Trustee Soto's toes or anything, um, do we know the last time we had a training in Monterey County and are we working with law enforcement in Monterey County? Which training are you referring to? Uh, this is considered the eldest training, right? No, so this actually is incorporation of all plan levels. So you'll see up here uh, one of the pieces, which is that center band uh, arrow, mm -hmm. actually talks about all of the drills. So those would include shelter in place, they'd include ALICE training, fire, evacuation, um, and also uh, uh, earthquake. So it's not just one incident, it's multiple. Yeah. So the plan has to cover all of them. Uh, we are working with our local law enforcement, both sheriff and WPD, uh, to make sure that we're moving through the process of um, following the same protocols uh, that they are. Have we been working with Monterey County? Uh, we have reached out to Monterey County. I have not received feedback from that. Um, I will say that the ALICE design does not change what law enforcement is gonna do on arrival. It actually brings forward the alert system. It brings forward our folks informing us earlier. All of those are gonna be needed before we even dispatch to law enforcement either way. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Chris, um, for your report. I had actually a question on your, sure. um, back a couple slides. The, um, the second part, that one. Yep. That you said, so this is just to um, district personnel, right? When, when you say district personnel, are you just referring to administration, principals, or are you, is that encompassing all certificated and classified employees? Right, so our classified employees and our certificated staff are part of the process of their site level reviews. So one of the things that they do is, it, our teachers have access to the site evacuation map. We want our folks to know where they're going. We just don't want outsiders to know where our kids are going. So they do have access to this part on site. Our principals do go through these pieces of, if we're leaving a campus, here's where our reunification site is. So we do go over it with staff. Um, that includes those shutoff valves, those blueprints. 
MNO uh, absolutely knows of where course. the blueprints are and where those shutoff valves. In fact, they're an active part that if we were to have a gas leak, they're responsible to help us, uh, you know, remediate that and turn those pieces off too. Okay. Um, and then the next question I had just regarding sure. this, is this shared, it may be sort of piggybacking off of this, but is this component shared with our local emergency systems like the fire department, law enforcement, county sheriff, do they have access to this? Yes, so uh, each one of our law enforcement agencies actually do have access to this. It's a requirement by our ed code to have them review it. So each one of the plans that we're presenting tonight has been reviewed by our local law enforcement. So that is going to include the Watsonville Fire Department, um, the Central Fire Departments, the Santa Cruz County Sheriff, Watsonville PD, and Monterey County Sheriff and CDF? Only law enforcement. It actually does not include fire department as one of the ed code measures. Oh, really? Wow. Okay. They do come out and do uh, rounds to make sure that, that we're doing uh, our evacuation drills, but they are not required to sign off on the actual plans. So, so then fire departments don't have access to this as part of our emergency services? They do not have access to um, the plans themselves. We wouldn't be opposed to that either, right. though. <laughs> uh, it's just not a requirement by the ed code. Okay. All right, and so then coming back, I guess the question is, sure. all current law enforcement, including Monterey County, Santa Cruz County Sheriff, and Watsonville PD, this is- Have access to have access. absolutely. Okay, great, thank you. Trustee Soto. Yeah, I just had a follow up to uh, Trustee Dodge's question regarding Monterey County. Who's the point of contact that you tried to contact over there? I would be happy to answer that, but I'd prefer not to answer it in open session in fairness to that individual as well. Okay, fair enough. Uh, that way I can reach out to my contacts out there as well to kind of push this along. Thank you. Appreciate it. So I, I, you know, I, I used to work in the classrooms of my kids and I've been on on Valencia's campus when the fire department has come into the classroom and in fact cited <laughs> the teacher for having too much construction paper on the bulletin boards. <laughs> or the ceilings, that happens that too. seriously <laughs> happened and all of the teachers had to go through and pull down like most of their, you know, displays. Um, I also sat on the site, site councils where um, these plans would come before us and we would approve them alongside it, uh, school administration and law enforcement and then they go up to the district office level and then to the COE and then to the state so there's several levels of oversight for these and I'm glad to know that all are completed because I know that's sometimes hard to get everybody's safety plans in on time and I'm really happy to see that that all of them are completed this year thank you and before us Okay, any other? Oh, Do Trustee Dodge. Thank you. Uh, is it possible to reach out to Watsonville Fire Department to ask if they're interested in being able to read this or be part of this? Yeah, absolutely. Because I, I think Watsonville Fire Department is, a lot, you know, a lot of them are from, from Watsonville and I think they would have first-hand knowledge in any type of emergency, earthquake, fire, and they also carry a paramedic and so I, I think they would be an important piece of this project. So if, if we could do that, thank you. Okay, with um, no further discussion or questions, I'm looking for a, a motion to approve this I'll item. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. President DeSerpa, yes. I'd like to make a motion to extend our meeting mm -hmm. um, to midnight. To what time? To midnight. To midnight. Okay. Yes. We'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion passes 601. Thank you. Um, okay, next is 9.2, resolution 21 25 intent to sell a permanent easement rights to improve the overall safety around Lakeview Middle School. This is a report by our CBO, Clint Rucker. Thank you. Thank you, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, so I'm here before you tonight to talk about a intent to sell or grant permanent easement rights to a parcel of land that we own near Lakeview Middle School. 
Um, Caltrans and the city of Santa Cruz are actually looking to work on that road at Houlihan and 152. As many of you know, currently it has a very short, about 50 foot left turn lane, as well as a right turn and through lane. And for any of you who have been on that road, that straight slash right turn lane kind of becomes into two lanes when it really shouldn't be. Um, what they're looking to do is really create two left turn lanes. One will be a left turn only, one will be a straight and left turn, as well as creating a right turn lane. In order to accomplish this, they need to widen the road. Uh, specifically, one of the areas they need to widen is at the corner of Houlihan and 152, which is technically our property on Lakeview's, um, as part of Lakeview's land. Um, if we can scroll down the, on this one, actually the other exhibit A. Uh, go to the other exhibit. We could. Thank you. Um, so this land actually is not on, while it is on our property of Lakeview, it is not actually in the school itself. So if we scroll down there, that shaded area is what they're looking at. It's about 93 square feet. So it is a very small amount of land. Um, if we were to attempt to sell this land, they have assessed it as what they consider nominal, meaning it has no price to it because it's such a small amount of land and it's an area where you can't really build anything on it, you can't create anything on it because it's brushed up, would be brushed up against our property in a road. Um, what they're asking for is permanent easement rights. So the reason we do permanent easement rights is it allows us to maintain the fact that it can only be used specifically for this road. It does not actually give Caltrans the ability to then turn around and resell that property for another use. So we are asking the board to approve a resolution as an intent to sell. It's the first step. Whenever we grant permanent easement rights or attempt to sell any land, we have to first put out a resolution of our intent. We then need to publish that in a newspaper. And then we need to come back to a public hearing as well as another action item to approve the actual sale or granting of permanent easement rights. I've been working with the city on this for about three or four months, trying to find a solution um, that would benefit the district as well as city. They are not asking for any funding for this, so this isn't a project that we're funding. It's simply allowing them to have the rights to that easement to be able to widen that road. They'll also have a temporary construction easement of about 300 feet, but that will be temporary. Again, this isn't actually impacting any of the land that our students actually use. It's actually on the outside of the fence. So it's actually pretty much, if you go down to that corner on Lakeview, or on uh, 152 and Houlihan, it is effectively the sidewalk area or the plants near it that we just technically own. So what we're looking for tonight is for the board to approve the intent resolution on the intent to sell, and then we'll come back at a future board meeting to finalize. Are there any speakers? None. Any questions? Trustee Acosta? So um, just, I guess I'm, and I'm, I'm really familiar with the area, but I'm trying to visualize what it is you're saying. So it is that part of that sidewalk? Yeah, so the sidewalk, while not ours, right next to it, the kind of dirt area is ours. And that's where they would be pushing the sidewalk to that dirt area. And then where the current sidewalk is would become the road to widen the road. Okay, so we are not talking about eliminating the sidewalk. There. No, no, the sidewalk is actually gonna be extended. They're gonna extend the sidewalk longer on, um, on 152. But in order to do that, they need to effectively move the sidewalk over. Right, and so in what assurances do you have that that is what will take place? So because I mean, is we're- Is that in writing in part of this? We can them? get that in writing. They, do, they did in their proposal include um, what was included in our exhibit that shows all of the steps they will be taking. But I can absolutely, um, as we move forward with them, ask for in writing when they do the purchase contract to say that there will be a sidewalk maintained at that area. Okay, and, and, and it's not that I think anybody has any interest in increasing, you know, risk or safety or causing safety hazard issues to our students, but the only way I will be comfortable with moving with this, particularly because this is my trustee area, is if that we have that assurance. So with that conversation that yeah. you, we just had. 100% understand. If you get that assurance, I will make the motion to go ahead and approve this so you can move it forward. Okay, and, and when I condition. bring it back for the actual sale, will I will have that Will you emphasize that? Yep, absolutely. I'm good, thank you. So that was my motion of approval. Um, that was a motion, is that what you said? Yes. A second. Okay, any other questions or discussion? I just have one. Okay. Um, when we're, one of the things I just wanna put out there, 
because it was listed in our board docs, but I think it's important for public to know. That we're also looking at adding bike lanes correct. to that, so, correct? So Houlihan uh, currently, for those who are familiar, does not have a full bike lane. It'll actually, this project will complete the entire bike lane on Houlihan, as well as create one uh, turning bike lane for them as well. So it's really a great project for that street. Our part in it is just allowing a small piece of our land so that they can complete the project. And unfortunately, that's what's been preventing them from moving forward. Thank you. Of course. Trustee Holm. Just verifying my understanding that it's like, okay, so this project, you know, it's actually increasing safety around one of our school sites. Mm -hmm. okay. 100%. So again, creating a dedicated turn lane that's longer, a second turn lane to help uh, traffic. As uh, Trustee Shocker mentioned, extending the bike lane that's currently on Houlihan, as well as extending the sidewalks on um, 152. And crosswalks. Yes, okay. correct. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Trustee Orozco or anyone? So the entire reason for this project is to increase safety. Yeah. Absolutely. They also will be putting up um, signs for uh, speed limits, radar signs. They will also be, um, again, extending um, the curbs as well as making them ADA compliant. The city and Caltrans whole idea is to make it a more safe environment for traffic. And since our students do use that area quite a bit, it's a great win for the district. And the price of sale will be? Um, so we'll be uh, just charging for the construction easement, which would be $500. Again, when they assessed it, it was nominal, which um, what could effectively happen is they could take the land through eminent domain, but we don't want to go that route because we want to support the project. It's something that helps us. Great, okay. Um, we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries Thank unanimously. You so much. Seven zero. Okay. Um, next up is item 9.3 to approve a job description and bilingual stipend MOU for a school counselor. Um, this is for Newcomer and International Academy, and this yes. will be presented by our. Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources, Allison Nizawa. Yes, thank you, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. So I'm excited tonight to have this job description in front of you as well as an MOU for a bilingual stipend. As you saw in the report and discussion from, from Lisa with regard to the LCAP, they're, we're wanting to add a position in which will be housed at Watsonville High. So it's a school counselor position that will be able to work mostly with our um, some of our most vulnerable students who are, are newcomers to the country and those that have been with us for four years or less. Um, this position will be really um, paramount in terms of making sure that these families when they're coming to our, to our district are able to help get re receive support in navigating not only the school system but the community and making sure that they're put in touch with resources that could be vital for them while they're here. Um, as I said, the position will be housed at Watsonville High. Um, however, it will also support the International Academy that's also at Rolling Hills. So we will have some continuity between families that are coming and starting in our International Academy and then pro um, progressing on to Watsonville High. Um, so again, former high school principal, it's also awesome to see this position to also help kind of bridge that gap and we're seeing a bunch of transcripts that are coming from other countries. Predominantly, we see them from Mexico, but we do get them from other countries. And so to have a counselor that can also help make sure that our students coming to the district can stay on track and be on track to be college and career ready is also something that's super important. Um, we worked, uh, or I worked with PVFT as well to develop the job description and the MOU that you have. So the MOU is for a bilingual stipend. Currently in the contract, bilingual stipends are only for classroom teaching positions and teachers that possess a B-clad. Counselors, PPSs don't come with a B-clad. Um, but we do feel that this position is vital to being bilingual and it's a bilingual required position. And we also wanna value that expertise and that skill and providing a signing bonus. So that's why you see an MOU in front of you as well um, because we don't have it in contract. And so we worked on spelling that out for this position because it is, it's new. So um, with all that being said, I hope that you will approve the position and the MOU. Are there any speakers? No. Any questions? Jen Holm. And I'm just wondering, you know, so I, I, I get that this counselor would be taking on some, some new responsibilities, but does that, those new responsibilities offload some of the responsibilities of our existing counselors? Does it help with that at all? Yeah, so at Watsonville High, you would have then another additional counselor that would support that population of, school, of students. So they wouldn't necessarily be on the caseloads of the other academic 
okay. they would be under under this one. So it would help lighten the load a little bit for our, the counselors at Watson High. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm sure we have probably like a smaller newcomer student population of PV High School. So I'm wondering if this position would also be supporting those students at that school. I think the idea behind the position is to get our newcomers kind of through the, if they don't come at middle school through the International Academy to be at Watsonville High because this is where the supports are gonna be there the most. Um, but we do understand that sometimes families are at different sites and different schools and so the idea is to also support the family and the families that we have. So although we know we have newcomers at multiple school sites, I think the idea is to provide the resources and get them at the sites where this position will be um, so that we can support them better by having them at the school that they're attending than, and where the counselor is. And if that's not possible, would an alternative be offering transportation? To yeah. Is that what we're going yeah, to Yeah, so I'll give you an example. So we have approximately, four, well, we have exactly now because we added one. We have 40 students at the International Academy at Rolling Hills. They come from multiple school sites. We do, because we have a waiting list, we do have 14 additional newcomers at the other five middle schools. Oh, okay. slash intermediate schools. Um, and so the, the goal is for us to have, because it's all about economy of scale, right? Having all the students that need those specific supports and resources at one location. So the goal would be to have, um, whether they're Aptos, student, Aptos High students or they are PV High students, be at Watsonville High with this newcomer program that we're gonna be implementing. Okay. Um, and so it, we, currently we do provide transportation to for those students who aren't members of Rolling Hills um, to get to that location. Um, the reason why we have the other 14 out there is because we have a 20 to 1 ratio. We tried to do a better ratio than the regular and um, currently there's 20 students in each of the two classes at Rolling Hills. So are we looking to expand? Um, well, I would say we would probably do more of an expansion at, at PMS most likely mm. um, because it, we have a cadre of students that already go to Rolling Hills from that area and so we'd probably um, look at a cluster um, that's a little bit far away from Rolling Hills um, so that those students again don't have to go across the entire school district. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. For many years, our district supported um, our, through the Diocese of, of Monterey, um, our Catholic Charities Organization here in Watsonville, and they, we gave them sort of a nominal $5,000 every year to provide services and a group, support group for the newcomers. Um, and I don't think we are doing that anymore, but um, under the guidance of Maria Runciman, that, that happened for many, many years. Um, so I'd like, to, I'd love to see that happen again. I don't, I know we are sort of looking for outside um, service providers um, that might have capacity to help families and I think they do. So anyway, so I just, I just wanna put that out there. Um, I think this is a great position and I'd like to make a motion to support it. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries seven. Zero. Thank you. 9.4, the approval of the Playworks pilot expansion project and this Report will be delivered by Mr. Casey Klappenbach, our Assistant Superintendent of Elementary Education. Good evening, President De Serpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Tonight, I have the pleasure of reporting back to you on our Elementary Playworks pilot and request your approval to expand our partnership with Playworks. So if you can remember, Playworks is a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to empowering our students through play, 
um, empowering them with tools to resolve problems on their own, um, and also making sure they feel included um, in a positive climate, and most importantly, uh, maximizing, helping to maximize instructional time at school. So um, these are their guiding principles I kind of just summed up. And if you can remember, we started off our initially our partnership with them. They were helping us map out safe areas and spaces on our school campuses as we prepared to return um, back to our school sites. And so while we um, surveyed our parents and our stakeholders, our staff, and students, what a couple things came up. We really needed, they were really concerned about making sure that students were playing outside and had that the the peer-to-peer -peer interactions and that it was done in a healthy and safe way. And so as we continued to build our partnership, we realized it was a perfect match with them because it matched our restorative start. It matched identity, belonging, and agency. Um, and the need, the SEL needs and concerns. Um, it helped by valuing identity, belonging, and agency through helping to ensure that all students are included during recess through opportunities to play, all students, empowering student leaders, building student agency by providing tools to resolve those conflicts, and by developing community with daily rituals and routines. And so here are a couple quotes. There's one from a teacher and one from a student and so the first one, it is great to see how PlayWorks helped rebuild community after the year and a half of distance learning. And that was a, a Radcliffe Elementary teacher. And here's another one from one of our students. They made it safer for kids to play. So that's the language that a student actually <laughs> used. Um, so as we're looking at it, what does a better recess mean? right? There's three main things that it brings to our students. The first one is conflict resolution. It helps equip our students with the ability to solve conflicts on their own, right? And those disagreements. It also helps build leadership skills within our students themselves, right? To be able to start developing their sense of fairness, communication skills, cooperation. And then lastly, that academic success. We know that when students are outside, they're actually playing and utilizing that time wisely and running and getting along with one another. They go back into the classroom and they excel academically. They do much better. They're more likely to be included in those discussions and to have that confidence also. So this year, um, our PlayWorks pilot modules um, had three modules and it, in, it um, included six of our sites, as you can see they're up there, Amesti, Ansoldo, Calabasas, Minty White, Radcliffe, and Valencia. And so they participated in all three of those pilots. Towards the end of last year, they um, were able to send a team that participated in the power of play, um, a shorter introduction with some of the routines and callbacks and some of the, the rituals. So then, um, and then at the beginning of this year, we were able to do a two-day training with them, um, providing the re recess implementation with the teams from their sites also. And then towards the, in November, we finished with a recess reboot, which included PlayWorks coming out with their coaches to each of the sites for four days, amplifying the work that their teams had done on their sites. So this year we are asking that we continue with adding additional six sites, and those are um, on the screen in front of you, Alianza Hall District, H.A. Hyde, Landmark, Marvitz, Marvista, and WCSA. And you can see an artifact from Calabasas Elementary um, encouraging kids to play the, the new game of the week um, there. And so here are, are seven of the components that really make up the, the PlayWorks um, program. As you can see, we have some students, some junior coaches that are leaders that are helping on a primary recess. And those are our junior coaches on, at Valencia. And so um, building those leaders, those junior coaches, as you see, it's also developing um, structures for play routines at the beginning of recess and at the end, and structures around the um, playground that make it safer so our students aren't all running out in the same direction or they're not all running out at the end in the line and knocking each other over. Um, also, um, really utilizing 
um, consistent problem solving strategies like Rochambeau, so they're not arguing over handball, right, when they're out. Um, and then providing um, novelty things like games of, a week, of the week that keep things fresh for our students and active, so they're playing and they're not sitting. And then also making sure that all during class game time, our teachers have consistent games. So students learn how to play those games and they actually know how to do it when they're on their own at recess, right? Or at lunch recess or another time. And then building that staff capacity. So not only are, are some of our certificated teachers on that team, our classified um, team as well, right? So they have. Um, they are working together, so our yard duty that are out there at most of the recesses and lunches are empowered with the, and equipped with tools to help support the students and how to um, be positive and, ha and build those relationships. And then lastly, the community building effort. Um, not only are they given strategies to build community with the students through the junior coaches and other techniques, but also activities to do with staff during their staff meetings, bringing people together and building capacity with their team. And then this is just a quick Playworks implementation roadmap. So you're like, Casey, what does that look like for a site when they're, when they're going back and implementing this? It's that first power of play module they start with, they send their team, and then they go um, and go back to the site and they start planting the seeds and doing some of the activities and in games and rituals with their with their staff and then it leads to recess implementation day one which is all day they're learning games structures for their playground uh, efficient use of using equipment um, and and things like that and then they come back and they um, complete recess implementation day two where they also have team planning time so this is where PBIS actually goes perfect with this too, because a lot of the same team members are on the PBIS team where they can plan strategically how to implement at their school site. And then they go, they're sent back to their, to their sites to really implement their site plan. So as they're implementing it, then the final phase is recess reboot when the coaches come in and amplify and accelerate and give that feedback and consultation. On, at actual recess time. And they're there for four days straight, um, really, really helping to lift that work. And so here, as we're, as with any pilot, we wanna make sure that we're surveying, right? We're looking at data and we're surveying um, the people that are implementing and part of that process, right? And so these are some of our, our staff members that are participating at one of the school sites. And so as you're looking at it, here are three um, questions that were on the survey. And, um, and these percentages show that they were either agreed or strongly agreed with the statements. So the first one is, since Playworks, climate at recess has improved. So 75% of those of the staff members agreed that it, that it has. And that's in a short amount of time. So this was done after. Um, the last phase, so this was November, you're thinking, right? So they, they haven't even been implementing, they didn't get that last boost that long ago, right? And so then the second one is since Playworks, student discipline has decreased by 52%, right? And then lastly, uh, more students are engaged or included in safe activities, 83%. So I know you're probably thinking, well, what were the other Question, like what were the other choices? So the next one, the one in the middle with the most, um, the next most um, percentage of, of votes was where I can't tell yet. So that was a choice. So a majority of the miss, the 25% would be, I can't tell yet because it's so soon, right? And so we will continue to survey our staff and um, students. And then the other choice of course is, a disagree or greatly or strongly disagree just like the the agree piece and then these are just a few more quotes my favorite one is that middle piece from the msd elementary teacher more options for games at recess has really helped students stay entertained and even join new groups or meet kids from other classes the yard duties are empowered to lead 
<clears throat> and the routines and reminders are helping reduce issues. It would be great to continue this program. And so you have a couple other quotes there, too. And then we move into our student voices, right? Which we always love to hear the most. So this is coming from third through fifth grade students. And so that first one again, um, strongly agree and agree. Um, 47 um, play work, 47 percent play works has made our playground safer. So that was one of the most important things for us. So students are acknowledging that. Our second one is second. Um, since PlayWorks started, there, is there are more things to play at recess, and that's a 65%. So students are noticing that. And that third one, there are fewer conflicts now since PlayWorks came to our school. That's, so that's 37%. So that, if you're thinking about it on a playground, that students can actually acknowledge that 37% less con or fewer conflicts um, really is making an impact at those sites. And so, Silvestre, can, Mr. Silvestre, can you play the video clip? <laughs> yes, just a second, excuse me. Oh, I did hear whatever you want to hear. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. So I hope that was worth it. It's always great to see our Calabasas Cougars in action, right? And so th these are just a few of our student quotes, but I love this one in the middle that says, I like that we say, good job, nice try. They help kids with arguing and conflict. And so again, I took the exact wording and spelling of our students right there, right? So you can see their language. But so they're taught how to say, instead of saying, you're out, right? They're taught how to say, good job, nice try. So, it's, so it, it helps with um, encouraging one another too. So with that said, I would like to thank all of our, our schools right there. Um, for all of their pictures and support with this, and staff requests your approval to expand our PlayWorks um, pilot. Thank you, Casey. Do we have any speakers to this item? None. 
Okay, any questions or comments from the board? No okay. Do we have plans to continue expansion to other s elementary sites? So at this time, our goal is to continuing, continue to get feedback and to really monitor, especially like discipline data and our staff and student surveys and, as, and look for that continued success. You haven't even had this for a year yet, correct? It's correct. just, okay. So we'll, when does your next survey go out? Our next survey will go out in spring. In the spring, okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, next up we have our consent agenda. Um, I'll move to approve. Thank you. Second. Again, acknowledging all the donations tonight with great gratitude. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right, and now moving on to action on closed session under item 2.1. I move to approve the certificate of personnel report as presented by the district administration on February 23rd, 2022 with 13 and 12 additional action items. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Under item 2.2, I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by the district administration on February 23rd, 2022 with six and seven additional action items. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. And under item 2.3, the board approved the non-reelection of three .0 FTE certificated provisionary employees for employee ID numbers 94, 7050, and 5443 with a 601 vote. Thank you. Um, our upcoming board meeting is, is it on here or is it on my written one? March 9th. Oh, thank you. Our upcoming board meeting will be on March 9th. We hope to see everybody then and until then have a very safe couple of weeks. Thank you. We are adjourned.